what is the best BMW M car? We have selected the following models for you to fight in this very interesting comparison. With, first of all, the all-rounder, the BMW M340i, also comes close to the M440i, of course, so they are not too different. And then the M3, the true M3 here as the M3 Touring, this is the model that came out recently in this very special estate form. Then, meanwhile, who would have thought that the most sold M model is the electric BMW i4 M50. That's very interesting, how does that one compare? Then, we have the very interesting comparison BMW M5 versus M550i. So the true M model versus the M performance model in the previous generation trim, because that one was also very popular. And then how does it compare to the all new BMW 5 series here, the i5 M60, another electric M model. And then we're going a little bit smaller to the 2 series. And here we have the M performance model, the BMW M240i and versus the true BMW M2. Last but not least, should not miss in this test here, the BMW Z4 M40i. Which one is special in which way? Which one offers most fun in driving? Let's find out together. Enjoy this long episode with us together. Let's go. We have the sporty M performance model for you today, the M340i. We'll soon also show you different stylings, but here this M performance model has this mesh double kidney and also in the extended shadow line, there's also for here an option, you can get it in black, otherwise it would be in this matte, matte gray style. Headlamps, LED standard, optional and adaptive LED and when you go for an M Sport line or the M Performance model here, the lower part also has this sportier graphic here and also here then for a stronger look. And this color here is the famous frozen gray. I really love the matte paints. Good boy. And here you can see the contrast, the M Performance kidney with this mesh and this one here with the white vehicle, this is the base kidney already with the sportier design, black inside rather these vertical fins and then the matte frame around. Again, for this one you could also have the extended shadow line with the black kidney frame, but this one here to me looks a little bit more elegant. Here you can also see in these adaptive LED lights the blue accentuations. They are darkened then out with the M Performance model, but this one here already has the M Sport line. That means in the lower part, M Sport and the M Performance model have the same sporty styling. The length for well, how meter 71 or 185 inches that hasn't changed what has changed is standard now black frames around the windows right here so far it was an option with the shadow line now it's standard but you can depick it and still go for a chrome style if you prefer a more elegant styling then with the shadow line when you go for that one you have here the black mirror caps m sport of the M Performance model have the M badge right here. They ditched 16 inch wheels, now 17, 18, also standard for the M Sport, or option 19 inch wheels. You can see them also right here. The sedan has the more classic line here, of course. The estate is still available, soon I'm going to show you that to you. And here, the Hofmeister King is a design element right here, used both exterior and interior from past coupe models. Designed by Hofmeister, that guy. And that's so it's very interesting heritage also in a modern vehicle. Design lines here see that the second one evolves right here and then leads over to this rather strong rear. In the rear, the tail lamps have a beautiful three-dimensional design. Overall, a very consistent design here. The 340i is of course a little bit more screaming out, for example, in the top part here with additional lip here. You can either get it in vehicle color or in the contrasting color, both possible. Here the M color 340i, this is the six cylinder model. In the US you can get it rear wheel drive only as well. Otherwise in Europe, for example, is only available with all wheel drive. It has so much power, you know, only the Americans can control it rear wheel drive, right? <laughs> yeah, interesting decision by BMW, isn't it? Then in the lower part here, this, this diffuser style really strong and Audio <laughs> Crew Fake Exhaust Police is here for the Fake Exhaust Alert. Well, hmm, on the inside, well, the air does go through, but the outside tip, it has no real transition to it. Um, 
Yeah, so this is a more honest design for the four-cylinder models. Suspension-wise, a base 3 Series already has standard dampers, but they have kind of these hydraulic cushions that they are also somewhat progressive. Here then, today in this vehicle, the optional adaptive dampers. They are an option both for the base model and also for the M Performance model. If you go here for the 340i, the M340i, both standard and also adaptive suspension is stiffer each. And here we have the sedan in Brooklyn Gray. It's also a very interesting color, also with 19-inch wheels, M Sportline, and also here with the black double kidney, a nice contrast. So yeah, very striking design in this case. Do you like this one best? And the 3 Series is still available as the Touring here also in the facelift in Germany. Even more Touring than Sedan are being sold in the US. The Touring is not available. And here, once again, the base model also gets the black frames. Again, you can also depick it, then more of a chrome look. M Sport line, in this case, also 19-inch wheels and the minimal white color. So also a very nice contrasting styling between white and black. Would you actually prefer the Touring, the estate model, over the Sedan or the other way around? Tell me in the comments. Khaki, when you have M Sport or the M Performance model, you also have the M colors right here. Then keyless entry would be putting the finger here on the outside to close it or the hand on the inside to open, to open it. There we go. And door closing sound. Yeah, that's a nice door closing sound indeed. Inside of the door, also nice soft materials being used. Then this one also features the Harman Kardon sound system. It's a very nice option indeed, good for music lovers. This then with the Sportier M interior. It looks the same when you go for M Sport or the M Performance model. These are the animal skin seats, but soon I'm going to show you a you know, wide variety of different seats where you can go animal free and they have good new choices there indeed. Well, let's get inside. As for the seating comfort, yeah, you've seen already the news here. Soon going to show all the deals about that. This curved screen layout, this is new with the facelift. Soon a detailed shot to that. Here inside, typical sedan seating position. I wouldn't say it's best in the segment, especially for tall people, 189 or 62 with shoes. A lot of headroom left. There's also a panoramic roof available. But from the seat ergonomics, I think Mercedes C-Class and BMW 3 Series not the best for tall people. I more prefer the seats in the BMW SUVs, for example. As for the sedan, for example, the Audi A4 gives me more comfort as for the seating position. Um, yeah, just a quick comparison between the big German 3 competitors. Steering wheel in and out, up and down, very nice and easy, sm uh, smooth process. And this here is the Alcantara seat, Alcantara Sensatec mix. So I have microfiber on the inside. This is really cool because it stays warm in winter and cool in summertime. I would prefer this seat. It's not available on all markets though. In Germany, for example, it is available. So this is also a very nice choice. Also based in for the M Sport in Germany, for example. So either this then or the Sensatec seats. And here we do have the perforated Sensatec seats, here in this case in red, but they're also available in black, beige or brown, depending on the market. They're also available in the US and in the UK and also in the German market. And indeed, here this perforation, they're breathable for that case, then very soft, nice, high quality. BMW, by the way, ensures that they have the same durability as animal skin leather. So they did that in their long-term tests already. And they're also working on further technologies, for example, to put the seats in a 100% recycle, recycling material. And also even further based on plant materials like desert text, so based on cactus fibers, or a so-called myrum seed. There's already a first sample of that. This is also mixed from different plant materials, for example, from natural rubber ingredients. Very interesting. So to make it basically full circle. And from 2023, BMW will also step up the game as for the steering wheel materials. For the first time, you will also get animal-free steering wheels. We already have a sample from a BMW iX steering wheel, and they are also again it is more sustainable, less use of resources. It has the same durability. And it's a very interesting figure, by the way. So if you ditch animal skin leather from the whole interior, you save 85% of the emissions in the car interior. And that is, of course, a very crucial thing. Interior overview. Well, styling-wise, it looks pretty amazing here with this through screen. 12.3 inch on the left, 14.9 inch on the right. But it comes with a catch indeed. 
Well, you still have the manual volume knob. However, the climate unit here, this has gone into the screen, no more real dials. So to me, this is a disadvantage to control while driving. You could also use the voice control, but to me, this is not a real advantage. Here when we power up the car, it changes. For example, temperature 20 degrees. Temperature yeah. 20 degrees. Interesting. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Change temperature to 20 degrees. Oh, I, I now drive 3,800 kilometers. I'm... I'm cold. That works, for example. But yeah, it shows... I just prefer the real diets, you know. So at least it stays in this position here. Well, you can see here, as for the main infotainment screen, this is here the normal map. It is also actually decently fast, but the OS 8 system, in contrast to the OS 7, has just so much more complexity that you have like a menu overflow, I would call it that way. And to me, it was easier in the OS 7, especially here, you have four, but then the vehicle app is missing. So you have to go here and then either with touch or the no part, live vehicle. And then, for example, you get to the uh, consumption figures and so on. So to me, this is actually too complicated. However, you can always use, of course, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto Wireless. Soon I'll look at that. And this is the Apple CarPlay integration right here, full screen, really nice. And then the music, Harman Kardon sound system. Yeah, to me, it's, it's really fitting to the whole vehicle, that sound um, has a nice surround character. Yeah, really like it. And as music lover, I would always go for that indeed. So good integration. And what else is cool with the OS 8? It's a good advantage that when you use Apple CarPlay and then go to Apple Maps, then you can have, you know, put your address in there. Let's see. Um, I don't know. Let's go to Berlin or something. Here we go. And as soon as we start the navigation, now we have the advantage. Yes, that's my phone. Don't have too much signal here at this moment. So as we, soon as we start the navigation, we can also have it then on the left side here of the instruments. And here you can see Apple Maps via CarPlay on the right side and also on the left side. This was not possible with OS 7. Remember that here in Apple CarPlay, Apple Maps works right and left, not with Google Maps. When you want to have it that Google, uh, that Google Maps is also on the left side, it's only working with Android Auto. It's not a BMW thing. It's a thing with Apple that they don't obviously allow the interface that Google Maps in CarPlay runs over the left side. But again, Google Maps could appear here when you use Android Auto. And here we have the instruments and yeah, Michelle is allowed to rev it today. Oh yes, Michelle, great. Because I'm sitting right next to him to be able to control here the different uh, contents and so on. There you can have the map um, inside. Here, for example, you can also have the Apple CarPlay maps on the left side. That is possible. That is a big advantage for the OS 8 indeed. And, for example, also assistant systems view that is possible. Or you can change the whole layout like this or like this. Um, yeah, but I think I more prefer this one here. What do you prefer? And head-up display to keep everything in your line of sight. Middle console, I appreciate that we do have alternatives to high gloss piano lacquer, like here the carbon fiber. Then here this console has changed. Well, this is the same, this you know, control knob here to control the infotainment system while driving. Good to still have it. And here this is a new shifting lever. It always comes with eight speed ma eight eight speed automatic gearbox, of course. Yeah, so no manual, but here in the small design, so you have a nicer integration. However, you have no classic sporty feeling. Some might not like that indeed. Driving mode selector and then you have this armrest well attached here and you fold up and then you have USB-C charging now. Rear door of the sedan. Top part is also soft touch, so that's nice. Good build quality indeed. And then here, through bench, this has always been the classic BMW rear bench styling, hasn't it? 
it even reminds me of E30 still. Then getting inside, well, one problem is that I don't have too much space here in the rear when tall drivers are present. When you put the seat a little bit higher, then my knees would better fit into this recess. Otherwise, with 189 or 602, it is a problem indeed. Headroom-wise, does work for the sedan. It's a little bit better with the estate. I'm going to show that to you very soon. The comfort is actually quite decent, but not too good. Also here for the for the left elbow, there's a very thick area here, thick yaw. So, yeah, not too much space here. It is okay, but not more. And also there's the big middle tunnel. Of course, it's a real driven platform or an optional all-wheel drive. So in the middle part, you can sit, but it's rather stiff then from the material also. Not ideal indeed. So what is new with the middle console here, that now you have two USB-C chargers. Here in the estate, you have a little bit more headroom. That's indeed easier. It's more comfortable to sit here headroom-wise, even if you're a little bit taller. So it's like was like this for the sedan and this then for the estate. So here is a significant difference. Trunk for the sedan, 480 liters, bigger now because there's nothing underneath. They are using the full potential, of course. Here have the loading sill and limited in height. Length about a meter of 40 inches and the width here is less. It's, yeah, it's rather here yeah, between, we are just like 90 centimeters or 36 inches. The estate, I'm going to show you that right now, of course, has the easier entry to the trunk overall. But for a mid-size sedan, there's actually decent trunk space available. You can fold the seats from here. That's also good here for a sedan. Second release, and then we have to push them from here or from... We have to push them from here. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Um, yeah, and that's actually quite cool then. And now the estate trunk. By the way, from the outside, I think it's really cool that they kept the same light design both for sedan and the estate. Classic with the estate is always that you can have the separate opening of the window here. And just listen to this. Oh, that sounds beautiful. When you really like flip, that's beautiful. <laughs> and then the whole trunk opening like this. And then, of course, you have the even loading sill. That's so much more practical. This cover here, by the way, you can either lift it up like this, but it's not automatic, or then here completely. Yeah, not my favorite solution. Let's take it that way. Let's take out the sample luggage. And you can see between the wheel arches, it's not a meter of 40 inches. That's a little bit disappointing. So that's more like, you know, 90 centimeters then, or 36 inches. It's just wider here. But you can see this would be a meter of 40 inches and we do not reach it between the wheel arches. That's not that good. This is actually quite cool here, these rubber pads, so things don't slide around. And you have this opening here with some more storage underneath and you know, emergency equipment. And then the top part here. And here you can also store the top cover. That's actually a cool thing. And that's also nice here. That's that. Ah, that's Good build quality. Let's fold that whole thing here. That's also really nicely done. The length here then in the estate. Yeah, this is about a meter of 40 inches in normal length. And then the length to the front seats is about 180 in meters or 71 inches. Interesting, of course, also the total height here in the estate. That is the big advantage here about 70 centimeters or 28 inches. As for engines, let's lift the hood here. This is the inline six cylinder, really cool, three liter of displacement, 374 horsepower, the top engine here beside the true M3, of course, M performance model. And just over four seconds in the acceleration figure, the all-wheel drive model is a little bit quicker than the rear-wheel drive model. Overall, ranging from 150 horsepower, that's the entry-level engine, both petrol and diesel, four and six cylinders, and of course, also plug-in hybrids. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge, BMW M340i. We'll put it to the Sports Shifting Mode. I also put it to the Sports Dynamic Mode. It would be not necessary, but it's necessary to put the Traction Mode to ESC Sport, and then we can also induce a launch control here. Hit the brakes, don't do it like I am, high patrols. Let's go. Well, there we go. This was even allowed to have the speed here, but again, 
please don't repeat. <laughs> so that was the acceleration. The figure is actually 4.1 seconds in the US and 4.4 seconds for the European model. So depending on the market, wow, it's really, really impressive. Very cool with the orbit draft model. The rear draft model is a little bit slower. So, but you can remember around four seconds. Really impressive. And this inline six cylinder three liter yeah, it just gives such a great feeling overall. This is really awesome. Of course, when we stay on the road now, I put DSC2 on completely. In the sports mode, the adaptive dampers give a little bit more feedback. Also, the steering gives a little bit more feedback, but that's one thing they still haven't fixed with the facelift. I think the 3 Series needs more response from the steering. I think it is a little bit too loose, too light. Even the BMW SUVs are totally fine. Recently had the ride in the X7 facelift. The big BMW SUVs have a better steering feeling than the 3 Series, which should be the benchmark for BMW steering. Yeah, I don't really get it. I don't understand, but yeah. I mean, it is okay to control and you can drive it in a sporty way, but it just lacks steering feedback. When I'm in the comfort mode, it's even lighter. So I would probably go with the individual mode and then make the steering feedback always as stiff as possible. Yeah, as stiff as possible, you got that. <laughs> and then maybe put um, the suspension to a more comfortable mode or something. And as for the suspension differences, indeed, when you're in the comfort mode, this adaptive suspension gives you a very nice comfort, even though we are here in the M Performance setup. In the sport mode, you have everything spiced up steering wise also for the throttle input and the dampers you feel this you know you just feel more of the road and for longer comfortable rides or something that's not really necessary but when you want to go on sportier rides of course that's cool so you have this flexibility here and the base dampers of course also do fine however i would not pick the m performance model or the M Sport then with the stiffer dampers without the dampers. So either go base base if you want to save money and if you go for an M Performance model then I would also go for the adaptive dampers because they have the sport set up each and then it's good to have the adaptive dampers to get more comfort out of these than by, by this. With the orbit drive of course you have a little more safety in winter when accelerating and so on otherwise the rear drive model is a little bit more fun you can get that in the US here for this model because you can just push it out of the corners a little bit nicer. However, it remains with a rear wheel bias, so that's then not too big of the problem. Still, I would like to get this one here also in Germany, not only in the US. As for the facelift changes while driving, of course, it's about the infotainment system as well. Well, the instruments are very well visible. I really like them. I preferred a little bit the easier, more classic layout and setup in the pre facelift model, but this is to me also totally fine. Yes, that one big advantage that for the Apple Maps or Android, um, or with Android Auto, also Google Maps, you can also get it in the left side. That's also a cool advantage. Other than that, I mean, the map here is also very well to read and it looks cool here, this, this whole setup. But while driving, I would like to you know, control the climate units as well a little easier. Doing that here is somewhat okay, but then vent strength is not possible. So I either have to leave it at, at the vent strength or go for the AC auto mode. And then the strength of the vents is also adapted automatically. So you have to decide for something then there. To me, this little bit step backwards. Um, yeah, but so it's, it comes indeed with pros and cons, as I said earlier. Driving wise, if you compare it also to the competitors, Mercedes C-Class or Audi A4, um, this one here, the BMW, always has the sportiest note, especially here as the M340i. Um, it would be comparable to the Audi S4 or S5 or then also the Mercedes C43. And there, of course, the Mercedes has also a sportier note. Um, for tall drivers, as for long-term comfort, I would go with the Audi A4, Audi A5, best seat ergonomics, together with the Volvo, by the way, with Volvo S60 or Volvo V60. They don't have the sporty, um, you know, corresponding models, however. Um, and how they feel in general? Well, the C-Class is 
quite narrow also from the cockpit here. The, Audi, the BMW gets close to that and the Audi has the widest cockpit, I would say. In, in, in that case, you can move around um, quite freely in, in there. The BMW, the thing is that it already feels sporty even as the base model and not only here as the M340i. Noise insulation, so far we've been driving like this 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour and it's a very good noise installation, it's really silent in here. So indeed, from this whole premium approach, this one does feel premium indeed, also while driving, both comfort suspension, how easy it is to control, um, there's no body roll or something, not at all, and then you can understand why it's still one of their most popular cars. And even if you don't use the launch control, just normal sport mode for example, you can always enjoy a very nice acceleration, you know, from that red traffic light. You're just waiting, you know, until it turns green. And this inline six cylinder always, you know, really rewards you with a nice sound stereo. Well, that was always zero to 60 kilometers an hour. Oh, you hear that? Plop, 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 plop. Really nice plop, plop, plop from the exhaust as well. Yeah, that definitely brings emotion and I mean when you let it run at a very low RPM pace then it's actually quite silent you know so when you have more oh, this is really beautiful in this case then it pays <laughs> it pays off when you uh, when you haven't gone electric yet um, let's see if they maybe also introduce these sounds at a later stage for the i4 or something like this so as for the fuel economy here with the um, Six cylinder, it is a little bit worse than with the four cylinder um, when you keep it at the minimum pace. But you can also drive this one here with some seven liters or more kilometers minimum. That would be even like some 30 plus mbg US or 40 mbg UK. But that's the best consumption figure. Usually, when you also have a little, some fun with it, it's more like nine liters on one kilometers, and then you're of course more like in the 25 mpg region US and uh, like 35 something um, mpg region UK. That is a more realistic figure than for, for this engine. Interesting is that with the new OS8 there are more and more software updates coming so they do over the air stuff. <laughs> I just want to say over the air sh yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So <laughs> Kids are watching as well, so we keep it. Um, so when you go to the different driving modes, here for example, sport mode, it has this, you know, hey, we're in the sports mode, visualization, looks quite fancy. And you've maybe been following also what I said in the X7 review. So BMW is also watching our reviews, and also watching your comments, your reactions to our videos, because our videos are also somewhat like a benchmark in the industry. And we said that it's actually a bad idea to go in a different driving mode and then you manually manually have to go back to the GPS and so on. This is a big problem. So now it switches back automatically. See here, I said sport mode. There we are. And it switches back again. And also, for example, when I go to the combat mode, it has more this um, canyon style with the road, uh, road trip style, something like this. And this is a very comfortable thing to do. So. You see this nice visualization, but then it's also gone again, and you don't have to manually switch back to the GPS. So this is a good thing here with the new infotainment system with over-the-air updates, that they can improve things when they see some customer feedback. 510 horsepower M3 power, but with also 500 liters of loading volume. This is the M3 Touring, and here with Thomas and Autofuel in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with an Autobahn experience here in Germany today, and all the details you need to know about the M3 Touring. BMW is attacking the customers also of Audi and Mercedes who have been offering the performance estates in the same segment. Here in the front, we can see frozen pure gray, awesome color, it's this matte paint and I think it really looks still elegant. However, here then the typical frameless double kidney in the front of the M3. This one also optionally has a carbon fiber package. We can see carbon fiber in the lower part here, also at the side mirrors. You don't have to go for that if that's actually too loud for you. And very interesting setup here also as for the wheels. 19 inch in the front, 20 inch in the rear. And then you can also optionally go for a racetrack package 
for 15,000 euros. Well, the most expensive thing about that is actually carbon ceramic brakes. You can also see them right here with these golden brake calipers. That is really impressive. Forged wheels actually to save some more weight. 4 meters 80 or 189 inches is the length here of the M3 Touring and we have the typical estate form right here. The roof can be bought in high gloss black in vehicle color. Do you like it visually even more than the sedan or maybe the coupe, the M4? Tell me in the comments. Here, look at these really strong hips here in the rear, even possible in here for an estate that looks super unique. It also gets the adaptive suspension. We also go through different driving modes later on on the German Autobahn. Of course, you can make it, let's say, not from super comfortable to stiff, but from stiffer to stiffest. <laughs> Turning indicators in the rear here, beautiful slim integration alongside the tail lamp. Yeah, I think that's how it's done. Looks really cool, doesn't it? Turning indicators in the front. This is here the so-called, I would say, like base LED. It's already full LED. Then you also have different turning indicators here at the side. They are normal ones, but then they have this special look because they're kind of like segmented with this, you know, with these elements here. You could also go for the laser lamps, and you have like 550 meters high beam in Europe at least. And then also the whole daytime running light signature and the turning indicators would look different. Optional, you can unlock the top speed to 280 kilometers an hour or 175 miles per hour. Yeah, but I think the normal top speed at 250 kilometers an hour or like 150 miles per hour is also just fine. Here in the rear, you can see really sculptured three-dimensional tail lamps. On your real eye, they look more red-ish. On the camera, they always look a little bit more orange-ish, by the way, just that you know that. And then this really strong lower part, diffuser style here also with the optional carbon fiber and four real exhaust pipes. But I think not with being too much, you know, I always like to keep it classy at some point. What do you think? Acceleration figure, by the way, 3.6 seconds to one kilometer an hour or 62 miles an hour. Which engine can do that? Under the hood, the 3 liter inline six cylinder by BMW, famous engine. Here, of course, an M tuned. Look at these struts here, the you know, for extra torsional stiffness in the front and 510 horsepower, 650 Newton meters of torque. It's all wheel drive, X drive, however, rear wheel biased. And you can also set it here in the driving settings. You can still drive it rear wheel drive only when you have deactivated all of the stability systems. And it also gets a rear differential lock. Standard key fob here with the M colors, then door closing sound. Standard actually, quite good. Then inside of the doors, sporty contrast stitches. And I really like this Hofmeister kink design, which they use on the exterior, also on the interior door handle. Also here, the window levers, not just plain plastic and so on. Then you also have an M3 entry wedge and also special steering wheel here, in this case also then with carbon fiber inserts. And you have this M1 and M2 buttons and this is where you can individualize your driving experience. For example, make M2 button the sportiest ride and M2 a sportier ride or something. But you can just decide it on your own. Zoom onto the instruments and so on. You either get the normal sport seats or these bucket seats. So these are optional and they of course look sportier, cooler. Here with the carbon fiber in the top there. It can get a little bit stiff than between your legs actually. And also here the M3 logo at the head restraint is also illuminated, so that one looks cool. And it is quite open actually, but it gets quite hot. It's only available in the animal skin, so there's no alternative for it. And of course for the raciest vehicle especially, they should go for microfiber like in you know Alcantara and so on. Um, that would be better also you know for the grip and so on. But considering this is such a bucket-like seat, it is not that uncomfortable from the seat economics. I was surprised by that. And I even feel it might be better than the standard sport seat. Um, yeah, even better than, as I said, with some microfiber and so on. Then, seating position. It's super low indeed and definitely lower with these bucket seats here than the normal 3 Series. So you really have to put the head-up display, which is also available, a little bit higher that I can still see it. And in this case then, 
massive amounts of headroom. Interior cockpit overview, your racing central. Here, steering wheel in and out, up and down, smooth process, no problem. A lot of carbon fiber here, the decor element and so on. Manual volume jog. However, here then, the integrated screen, a little bit curved, two displays, and the climate unit is just here inside. Of course, I like to have it more manual, but uh, yeah, some share my view, some say I don't care. So, yeah, what about you? And the lower part here, there's so much to control with M specific settings. Shifting lever, still rerun, this would be reverse, then here, drive mode, and one more time to the manual shifting. So here on the shifting lever, this and the shifting characteristics when it's all full of these three layers, then the shifting is, let's say, more extreme, more RPM, lower gears and so on. And if you really want it all manual, then I said just one more time to the right, then you have the manual shifting either in here, plus, minus, or at the steering. And here the digital instruments on the right side, you can put in the driving modes, then this would be normal driving mode, this would be manual shifting of putting it to neutral, left side speed and right side RPM. Here with the M mode button, you choose the different assistance systems characteristics. Set up here, this one then gets to the menu where you can individualize the settings for engine, chassis, steering, brake and the X drive, even go for the two wheel drive only mode. And you can also set these then on the M1 and M2 buttons and here for individually activating or deactivating the exhaust crackles. And you can also get this head-up display here with a loud speed and GPS view and so on, but you can also change it. Other than that, BMW Entertainment System, it's actually pretty quick. You also have this climate menu where then you can activate the seating when the engine is running. To me, yeah, not that much straightforward. And actually, and you have this main menu here for example also switching to the apple carplay android auto both available wireless and then here going back you also can access special m apps like m laptop or the m drift analyzer what about a short interior asmr or car smr session The seats in the back here, carbon fiber, weight savings, really massive, and these huge holes. Of course, there's not really a seat belt going uh, through there. That's just this racing gimmick in the styling. And as for the headroom in the rear with 189 or 6 for 2, no problem. Legroom here, you see, they look slim. However, it doesn't give you much more legroom or something. And it's, of course, really hard here. So for the back passengers here, the bucket seats is not, are not actually a good idea. So it does work with four tall adults, but just barely here with the knees overall. But then the ergonomics of the bench here in the rear is actually not too bad. So what does it make it a touring? Yes, this one here. First of all, here they separate the glass opening for quickly reaching over. That's always a nice feature and also unique selling point. Then of course the real hatch, electric hatch here and 500 liters up to 1510 liters. Here the width between the wheel arches is less than a meter or 40 inches, but wider in the very front part. And the length here is also a good meter of 40 inches. These rubber pads here, they actually you know, get a little bit inflated while driving and then it gets even stickier and it holds then a suitcase. This one here is the manual cover. You can also set it in here on the top part. That's also possible. And here at the side with these levers, we can actually unfold the seats. Here we go. Yeah, that's a nice solution. Then we can load all the way through. We are welcoming the BMW M3 Touring to the German Autobahn. There is so much to control here. For example, here the shifting shifts down earlier here. You can control that one, how the automatic shifting reacts. Now it's crisper. We can also change here to the M1 mode or even M2 mode. I've set it even sport here. Then here at the engine is on Sport Plus, for example. Then we also have the M mode, which I can set to Sport. Then you can also follow me here with the shifting and the speed in the middle. 
system systems are drawn back then so so many individual details you can control and the best is you find your own individual setting for each driving mode because controlling it while driving all the time is not that easy but here we found a very nice setup then for you to show you all the performance of the 510 horsepower and then you also have to pay attention which shifting mode you are in this here for example i have to shift myself one more pressing to the right when it says D, then the car shifts on its own. So always pay attention to that. And now we're starting from 50 kilometers an hour. Let's see what we can score for the acceleration. Let's go. <laughs> 180. And 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. Wow, that was really quick. The official acceleration figure from 0 to 100 or 62 miles an hour, 1 kilometers an hour, is 3.6. That's 0.1 seconds slower than the sedan, but who cares? Oh. That 3 liter inline six cylinder is a gem. 220, 230, and it feels like nothing. It's so easy, it's so well to control. These bucket seats they are holding us really tight. No problem at all driving towards the sun in the evening sunlight. So much joy it brings to you. And I mean, they're not that uncomfortable as they look like at first sight, actually, these seats. And once again, they have a lot of shoulder support. Therefore, they also take weight of your um, lumbar area and so on. Wow. And of course, talking about shifting ourselves, so I push the shifting lever one more time to the right, and then the car really stays in that gear. And then I can either use the big shifting lever to shift down when I press forward and shift up when I press backward. I love that setup. Some do it the other way around. I prefer it that way. And of course, also the shifting pedals. Oh, this Porsche Macani behind me is bullying me. Even in fifth gear here, it sounds great and it's a good acceleration, but I can also go back multiple gears, no problem at all. And then when I really put it to the rep, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also having fun. <laughs> when I really put it to the rev limiter, then you also hear that really like this plop from the exhaust there, from that sports exhaust. Wow. And the good thing is I feel so much in control still, you know, that when you turn off all the like all the stability control like ESC then you could also go to this two-wheel drive mode the rear drive only mode since you should not turn the ESC off on public roads we're not doing that but this four-wheel drive mode is still so much rear wheel biased that you never get the feeling of oh I'm dr driving like a you know boring all-wheel drive version or something no this is here always something and it hooks up to the road so well that, you know, that is, that is just amazing. The only thing, we talked about it in the um, different 3 Series reviews, is that the steering feel, I mean, here in the M, I feel it's a little bit better, definitely, but here, you know, um, it lacks a little bit of feeling, I feel, and of reaction, and then to this side here, it suddenly gets too progressive. Um, so it doesn't feel that natural, it's still a lot of fun, and you know it's not bad at all but I feel that the competitors here from the like you know Alfa Giulia or Audi S4 or yeah in this case it's RS4 yeah it's the RS4 then here of course against the true M model Alfa Giulia Quadrifoglio which is not available as an estate um, but just as for the steering setup you know that they do a better job that it gets a more natural steering feeling so that is one thing to criticize but you still feel connected to the vehicle. It just could be better because I feel the 3 Series needs to be the benchmark for steering setup at BMW. Now we do a connection between two motorways. It's always a lot of fun. The good thing is that everyone is hearing us. That's of course a safety thing, right? That everyone knows I'm coming here. And it's also a lot of fun to shift yourself here at the pedals, but we can also, of course, do it down there so then you have like a sense of natural feeling when you shift here 
It's also cool, right? Because this is still a real shifting lever. More and more shifting levers disappear and are maybe like just like really, really tiny. And sometimes it needs to be bigger. Back to the preview. <laughs> so, here we go. Shall I use the, the big shifting lever for you? Yeah, let's do that. Ah, stuck behind that one. Behind the Torneo Connect, let's race it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Wow, we're now hard on the brakes. Wow, they deliver. Yeah, you can make your family father life so much more exciting with this one, definitely. Sometimes, I mean, yeah, it is quicker and also more efficient just to use the shifting levers here on the steering wheel. But it definitely has something, you know. I learned driving a vehicle with manuals only. That's what you used to do in Germany. So everyone had manual cars, being at the expensive one still and the cheap ones anyway. And it was always so much fun to, to click the gears in. Very annoying in traffic jam and so on, but for driving pleasure, the manuals are really cool. And this one still delivers some kind of manual feeling, although it's not one, you know what I mean? So that's definitely a cool thing to have. Other than that, if you would all put it to, you know, the normal civilized mode or just if you shift up and let it roll, you can also more or less have the same 3 Series experience. The only thing you always feel is, of course, the suspension is stiffer. You have the adaptive suspension here, so it reacts also to the settings. So when you put it all back, yes, you still feel it stiffer and also you have these large wheels. They make a huge difference. So no doubt you do lose comfort in the M3 so if you want the soft comfort or this compromise of sportiness and comfort then you would go for the M performance model the M340i that would be the more clever and better choice in a way this one here more the choice without so much compromise but yeah after all it's now available also as the estate as the touring form here so you also have more everyday usability and yeah I feel you can still drive it as a primary vehicle with again some compromise to comfort especially suspension wise um, yeah the seats here I mean you feel some somewhat caged in but since I'm not the biggest fan of the normal 3 series seats this is then in that way actually a little bit better to me um, because I don't feel that I would have like less comfort here in these bucket seats so Leah what do you say <laughs> you, you love it? You so love much it? Fun, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love it that she has a lot of fun. That is, um, you know, you, you know, there's, um, you know, you have passengers who start to be really nervous and maybe start to freak out and say, like, stop the car, stop the car. <laughs> Had it all. Um, but there are also passengers who really enjoy it. And yeah. That's what you need at the car too, this, right? <laughs> ah, what, what I actually love about this vehicle, especially like in general driving the 396 cylinder with BMW, not necessarily that you put it in the lowest gear and rev it to the max, but just, you know, having it in high gear and then applying some slight throttle and you just feel this slight rolling, you don't have like this extreme acceleration, but you know, hey, the potential is there and just use the six cylinders, use the bigger displacement in comparison to a four cylinder engine that is just tuned. This one here, just use it in a higher gear and enjoy the fun also in a gentleman way, you know what I mean? Ah, oh, this is awesome. It has such a great balance in the corners, so much driving fun and at the same time I could be transporting a fridge back there, so um, <laughs> that's of course the key to it. Do I have less fun? than in the sedan, not at all, maybe even more. I mean, you could theoretically talk about weight balancing and that this year might even be better for such a vehicle because there's a lot of weight in the front axle with the engine and you could even argue that this one is better balance-wise, like weight balance-wise and 
I have somehow the gut feeling that I even have a little bit more fun with this. I'm not sure if that's really like based on facts, but just on that on the gut feeling, you know. So definitely a very interesting aspect. <laughs> what? That was a hundred kilometers an hour, sixty miles an hour. What? <laughs> This is a driving review of the BMW i4 as the sporty M50 here with Thomas and Autogefühl. Let's go! Mid-size segment, but the BMW i4 is not an electrified 3 series, platform-wise yes, but it's more like an electrified BMW 4 series Grand Coupe. Soon more to that. Here in the front we can already see a huge double kidney right there, but it's close. It has this M badge right here because this is the sporty M50 version. There are also base versions available. Then in the blue accentuations here around the logo signalizing the electric lineup and the color here for today, a true Thomas blue, this is Portimao blue but in the matte styling. So there's also a metallic Portimao blue available but here then in the frozen style how BMW calls it. Headlamps, standard LED, optional this year, the laser light then with blue accentuations. The length is at 4 meters 78 or 188 inches so size-wise this place in a region of a Tesla Model 3. Price-wise something different more to that later. Wheels come from 17 inch to maximum 20 inch. Here the M50, the sporty model, comes with 18 inch standard and then also optional these huge 20 inch wheels. And when you go for these, you also have in the rear these extended mud guards because the tires are just so much wider. The door handles are very, very integrated and this matte paint is so lovely. However, unlike in the iX where it just looks like this and you can, you know, can open it here, they also fold up a little bit. It's also interesting. Then you also have some wind efficiency gains here from the side mirrors and this is also when with this shadow line that you have it in a black contrast. Overall very cool and elegant styling and indeed is more like a 4 series Grand Coupe because it also has the fastback opening soon more to that. And suspension wise, this is really interesting, it automatically gets air suspension in the rear. But the dampers, nor front nor rear, are not adaptive. Optionally, you can get an adaptive suspension, it's called adaptive amp suspension. That one is also standard than in the M50, but then also with an even stiffer setup here. Looking really forward to drive this one. Why didn't they go for air suspension in the front as well? They say they want a more direct contact to the road and this platform here actually does not allow uh, air suspension on the front axle just from the building space and they also want it to be a little bit more precise when turning in and turning out so that it doesn't you know change the weight of the car in the front too much. With the electric vehicles there will be no differentiation between M performance models and true M models. It's just the M models. That's a new thing coming here with the EV lineup. So M50 is kind of than a true M model for them. All we drive, one electric motor in the front, one in the rear. The rear one is stronger. If you go for the eDrive 40 version, you will only have rear wheel drive. This one here goes top speed 225 kilometers an hour or 140 miles an hour. The rear wheel drive version goes 190 kilometers an hour or 118 miles per hour. I guess you can live with that. In the lower part here, a diffuser style, strong fins here also in a vertical way. So overall, I think, especially in the three-quarter rear perspective, they really nailed the design, didn't they? Just a minor detail, by the way, these are these, you know, three-dimensional plastic number plates. And indeed, they are more sustainable because if you compare them to the metal plates, they here use less resources in production and also they can be recycled better than the classic ones. Interesting, right? Sadly, there is no frunk. This one here is going from the same assembly line like the BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe or the BMW 3 Series, so they are not using an EV purpose-built platform. This is one of the drawbacks then, but yeah, also their all-electric iX doesn't have a frunk either, so BMW not so much about the frunks. However, we can also talk about the power figures and the battery figures. 81 kilowatt hours net, it's actually quite a reasonable size for that and projected range 500 kilometers or 300 miles. We'll see in the driving part if this is true. And acceleration figures here for the M50, 3.9 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And then 5.7 it would be for the E-Drive 40, the base model then with rear wheel drive. And recharging, 11 kilowatt AC or 205 kilowatt DC then from 10 to 80 percent in 30 minutes at an according charging station. 
car key looks like this. It's the classic 3 series car key, but slim and light and I really like it. Classic stuff. And then door handles once again fold out like this. What about the door closing sound? It's frameless though and yeah, here the door closing sound is really bad actually. Nice however, the interior build quality, soft touch here and also how the handles are being you know, formed out. So Hofmeister King design clue for the inside. And then the M50 comes with the M steering wheel, also with contrast stitches then here on the inside. The i4 in general with the blue BMW electric badge. And then seating wise is very interesting. These here are the sport seats and this is also the animal skin equipment because you can see it here when it's like in this, you know, separate, many separate, you know, parts. There you can see that this one then is from animal skin origin. However, standard here for the M50 model would be a surface mix of Alcantara and Sensatec, animal free. And for the base seat, you start with fabric and Sensatec mix. And for the i4, you can also get pure Sensatec seats. They are also perforated, beige, black, brown or red. So four colors available. The ventilation function is not yet available, but BMW told me they are working on a, per, on a perforated, ventilated Sensatec seats. And this would actually also be the most choice or the most frequent choice for the majority of customers. And by the way, why did I switch to the big microphone here for the interior? Well, there are so many electric interferences that you hear that more on you know, the attachment microphone. This one here covers it a little bit better. Seating position here in the front, we really know it. It feels like in the 3 Series or like in a 4 Series, completely normal. It's not the most comfortable for long journeys, I have to say. Steering wheel, however, can be adjusted up and down, in and out and so on. So you feel that it's not an electric platform, otherwise you would have more space in the front. Headroom, by the way, without the panoramic roof, here 1 meter 86, 6 foot 1, enough left. But again, it's rather a little bit cramped. Cockpit overview, again, similar to 3 series or 4 series, but then you have this widescreen cockpit, 12.3 inch left, 14.9 inch right. This curved display, this is of course pretty fancy, but the thing is, then there are no manual dials for the climate unit. Hmm. You do not have manual climate dials, however, at least a manual volume knob. In that M50 here, nice carbon fiber decor element. In the digital instruments, we can see left side the speed, right side the E power, and on the lower end, then you will see the recuperation. In the middle part, you can adjust what you want to see, for example, also map info. And the head up display is, of course, always a nice option to have. It's nice that we still have traditional dials here at the steering wheel, left side for cruise control, and right side here, for example, for the volume. And then this operating system 8, completely new. This is one of the menu styles, but I think it looks kind of outdated a little bit. Climate unit always stays here in the screen. That's, of course, not that practical. You can use voice control. Yeah, but manual climate dials, most of us agree that it would be more practical. Then here on the left side, usually, you know this from the OS 7 or OS 6, here you have hotkeys to carpet, that's actually quite, quite good. But then again, below that would be the car menu, and that is then here, hidden in this whole thing in live vehicle. But why can't I access this here, right again at the hotkey part left, so I don't really get it. However, what's good is with the new system here, it's actually, you know, better as for the CPU power. So here, zooming in and out at the map, this is actually very, very good overall. And here the CarPlay, nice integration like this. And we also have a decent sound from that Harman Kardon sound system. Woo! Yay! This one still has the typical BMW Wings light in the top. Nice carbon fiber cover here for the middle part. And then typical inductive charging pad here for your phone. This one still gets really hot. In the newer vehicles, they also will have a ventilation system for that. Then adaptive cup holders right there. And the shifting lever with a nice blue electric accentuation. And here you can also pick the driving modes. And the most power you will only have in the not only sport, but sport boost mode. Classic control knob here, as we know from the 3 Series. And also here underneath the armrest, a USB-C charger and some more space. Well, and here's the biggest problem about this vehicle. Once again, due to the platform, yeah, I can hardly fit here in the back part. Headroom is quite okay, but legroom, yeah, it's kind of not existent for tall, not existent for tall adults. And in the middle part, I mean, I can't even move here in the back part. 
it's not too uncomfortable from you know from the bench itself and so on but just not enough space definitely considering the length of the car here usb-c chargers and the rear climate unit now you can see how big this middle tunnel is once again derived from the combustion engine platform and here cup holders for the middle armrest pricing wise around 60,000 euros or dollars for an entry model and here for the m50 around 70,000. That's of course way more expensive than the Tesla Model 3. However, you can also compare them to the more powerful ones. But what's better here with the i4 than with the Model 3, it does have a fast bake opening of the hatch. And that, you know, with one with a 6, 6 with one, I can send underneath it. Easy access in and out, maybe even putting a bicycle in and so on. This is of course the more practical approach. And this goes 470 to 1290 liters. And the length here, this is the channel where the length is measured properly still. Yeah, a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches in length. And the width here is a little bit more limited. This is then here 90 centimeters in width or about 35 inches. And the height to the cover, 48 centimeters or 18 inches. Overall height and a little bit more. You can also just pop out this cover like this here. You can, by the way, have a 12 power supply. For folding the seats, you have to go around them to rear compartment like this. One third, two third split. However, you can also have this ski hatch. So then you can also do an individual split like this. And that's then the maximum setup. And so see this, I would be driving one meters 75 or 68 inches. Welcome to Thomas's Active Driving Lounge with the BMW i4 M50. Sport boost mode, maximum acceleration, let's go. <laughs> what? That was 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. What? <laughs> Holy moly. I mean, yeah, it was slight, a little bit down in that part, but what the hell? <laughs> You also heard this uh, sound <laughs> theme they have installed here, cooperation by Hans Zimmer. Whew, and uh, if we compare it, um, yeah, I mean, to something we heard before, Porsche Taycan or something, Audi e-tron GT, um, it's not the you know, strongest or harshest sound. It's still somewhat subtle, but definitely here in the sport boost mode, the strongest one. One more time where you can see the speed because of the different camera mount. Let's go. Oh my goodness, wow, this is really something. Man. The steering feeling, especially while accelerating, is very unusual BMW. It kind of even feels out of control a little bit. Hmm, not too happy with that, actually. Um, hmm, <laughs> yeah, kind of mixed, no, not mixed feelings, bad feelings about this indeed. Yeah, but, you know, slalom wise, by the way, how the chassis reacts and so on. This is really superb, but once again, they're also feeling in the steering, mm, not to my liking indeed. All we drive, one electric motor in the front, one in the rear. The rear one is more powerful and the chassis itself and the steering and so on feels you know, kind of like BMW 3 Series or the 4 Series Grand Coupe. What is different here is definitely that we have more weight. So when we're, for example, going downhill, um, the car pushes a little bit more to the corner here. At the same time, we have a lower center of gravity because the battery pack is so low and centralized in the vehicle. And that again helps the agile driving feeling. So considering that this one here is way heavier than the combustion engine models, you don't feel it actually because it also kind of sucks you to the ground Due to that low center of gravity and that's really cool. As for the steering feeling, mm, you know it's actually quite okay. So I feel they also improved it if you compare it to the 3 series and the 4 series. Mm, there was also always this kind of issue that you know it didn't give too much feeling in low degree angle. Mm, it is still the case that you have more feeling here you know when you're at these you know 90 degrees turn 90 degrees turn or something and not so much in this you know minus two plus five degrees but i feel they have improved that a little bit um, maybe a little bit more progressiveness like here and a little bit less here that would be my wish 
but people can also maybe argue, yeah, okay, in that way I can, you know, in a more relaxed manner drive just straight on an autobahn or something. But overall, it's still fun to drive this car around. So it delivers great driving. Julie, oh, kids next to the road and always, of course, really careful. Recuperation as soon as I lift the throttle or also when I hit the brakes even more. There's this adaptive function. You can see it here in the instruments. So when the car sees there's a car in front of me, then there's harsher recuperation. And that's to me a very good, um, you know, very good way not to use a B braking mode, like a or one pedal driving feeling, because here in that way you kind of have both worlds. So when there's no one in front of you, the car is rolling. When there's something in front of you, the car is automatically applying a strong recuperation. I think that's a very interesting approach, definitely. And because sometimes you feel like, yeah, rolling is a little bit more comfortable. And sometimes strong recuperation is better and also safer, for example, when there's someone in front of you. And this adaptive recuperation mode could be actually the solution then for the future. So there's an also a better transition for people from ICE cars that they don't have this one pedal driving feeling at once. Um, so yeah, I think that that is really something, very interesting approach they found here for the regenerative braking. Oh, what's, what's your take on that? And now that boost uphill. Wow, <laughs> that sound experience definitely enhances the acceleration experience, definitely. And the thing that's really interesting, so uh, when you have that boost, um, the steering gets super light and that is a little bit, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Is it because the car really literally lifts from the ground or something? Um, but that's definitely a little bit irritating. Um, yeah, to me, overall, the steering is a little bit too light. And I think definitely, um, especially if you go from, a, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a sports mode, it should actually be heavier. By the way, here at 70 kilometers an hour, noise insulation is really great, so it's a very silent atmosphere here. Especially when you, for example, go back to a comfort mode and then you don't have this sound feedback and, and so on. So um, you can also use it as a cruiser and be like really, really calm. And the thing is really, since it's not on this EV platform, you know, for users of space, that's negative, definitely. If you, however, seek a good transition from an IF, from a combustion engine vehicle to an electric vehicle, this might be something because, again, this car does not feel too different from a 3 series or from a 4 series, yet at the same time you have the electric boost and you still have a great handling really because of the low center of gravity. So it's a lot of fun to drive this one. Overall, it feels really crisp. It, yeah, I mean, it rather feels a little bit like the Mm, I would say, um, you know, M Performance model, 3 Series or 4 Series, like um, the 340i models. This one would be, I think, um, the best in comparison. The true M models combustion engine are a little bit stiffer as for suspension and so on. This suspension here, the M adaptive suspension, is tuned on a little stiffer note than it would be if you go for that ad adaptive option with the normal suspension. Mm, but I think it still represents a quite nice compromise. By the way, even in the comfort mode here, you also have enough power, for example, here overtaking maneuver of this tractor. Yeah, so <laughs> that was also 50 to 100, easily done. But really, the feeling in the steering wheel is not adequate to the vehicle. That is to me the biggest criticism point. And suspension-wise, you know, I'm not a fan of mixing suspension technologies. They have air suspension in the rear not at the front. Yeah, they said that due to this platform being used, um, usually you don't have air suspension there in the front. You cannot really do that. And they also want the more precise turning in and, and, and turning out and so on. And they would need to use um, you know, the, the bigger platform to offer air suspension in the front. Yet at the same time, they went for air suspension in the rear because of the heavy battery pack and also when you then put some load in the trunk and so on. But to me, this is not really mixing that well. It might be something because I'm really, really, you know, finely tuned my body to feel these, you know, soft nuances. But I feel that the rear is a little bit softer. It's actually quite good. And that the front is a little bit stiffer, sportier. And I don't think that's a good, it's a good mix. 
either go for the smooth setup both front and rear or go for a stiff setup front and rear. It's you know something you know talking about a very very high level with a fine nose tuning but still I don't think that's a good decision. So definitely great boost, great handling, steering feel they need to improve that make it a little bit stiffer make it more natural yeah, and suspension technology wise I think it would have been better if they left out the air suspension in the rear and just put some good adaptive, damp adaptive dampers on it front and rear and that would have been better definitely for the whole driving performance. We'll also head out to some faster driving to test more about the noise insulation and so on but overall I think we can already say from driving this is here for a transition from combustion engine to the electric vehicles and of course still yet yet to come what about the efficiency and the range of this one here and on the motorway whoop, that was 52 1 on 30 wow that goes so quick it's really astonishing wow and now at a normal motorway speed of 120 kilometers an hour so like 70 miles an hour let's set it to the cruise control it's so also you know we can switch to normal cruise control and also the assisted driving mode then we also have a lane keeping assist let's see how that one plays out so if it works in a, in a very smooth way or not noise insulation so far at that speed very good very silent mm, of course you don't have any sound then from normal electric drive if you're in a comfort mode just the you know electric sound experience there the artificial one so overall you do get a calmer feeling because there's no like you know like sonora sound from that engine running all the time that might also be an effect where you say like hey that's calming for me you know so i'm also still looking forward for electric vehicles that are actually just mimicking the ice sounds i think it's it, it would be a better idea than letting them all sound like spaceships you know so because we like to have you know like six cylinder or eight cylinder sounds because it touches something very basic in our you know feeling and understanding so there's even that theory that it's that it reminds of us being you know like like a baby or even embryo inside the mother's body and feeling or hearing feeling and hearing the heartbeat that these low frequency sonora sounds are somewhat calming to us and that's why we like a v8 sound and when this is, this is actually true why can i just like select v8 sound v6 sound here in that menu it would just be software you know or open it for third party applications put an api in there and then people can program that themselves or whatever you know so that would be really something um that would be way cooler than giving millions uh, of dollars to the you know the, to the hollywood composer um, you know for this i i don't see like the big benefit in that one you know make something more fun and cool that's my take on it looking forward to your comments so let's induce this lane keeping assist let's go a little bit to the left now to the right let's see how the lane is being kept when i'm moving up to the yeah there it is so a subtle intervention mention then we also have a blind spot monitor there it is a yellow triangle and when i put the turning indicator then it's also flashing so assistant systems very well done very well integrated as for that and still a reasonable motorway vehicle as i said earlier the offering of space already in the front is not a, you know, not that great actually everything feels in similar seating position wise and so on just as you would be driving a normal three series or a four series in that respect actually looking at the white screens here while driving by the way is pretty nice however what's a little bit irritating is climate control i change like when i want to have it come into my hands just manually here because in that climate menu you can either switch from balance to dynamic and that's it and i cannot really pick like where exactly the vents are coming from and i'm so used to that for example like more power to the feet or, or didn't or maybe i didn't find it or something but then it takes too long to find it so i uh, yeah making things more complicated once again with these new software iterations and now let's go once again to the sport boost mode because 130 kilometers an hour to let's see whatever that's a 200 
kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. For this traffic situation, definitely enough and still good noise insulation and really stable on the road. So, yeah, I mean, the surplus in weight is in this case maybe even a good thing in that uh, case. But once again, the steering feeling, that is the thing that is lacking to be one with the vehicle in that case. Well, and as for the average energy consumption, like 19 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. So that's some 30 kilowatt hours on 100 miles means a range of 430 kilometers or 270 miles. That is not as much as promised, but still, you know, somewhat decent result considering it's not an all EV platform. BMW 5 Series at its best between these two vehicles here, 1,155 horsepower. BMW M 550i, the M Performance model, against the true M model, the BMW M5. Can this one here, the M 550i, keep up with the M5? And is the M5, the extra price worth between 30 to 45,000 euros or dollars between these two vehicles? Well, some buy a whole car for that. But what's the real difference here? Let's go with the exterior, the BMW M 550i. Here, since the 5 Series facelift, the grille leads over to the new headlamp styling here and adaptive LED are standard for this model and then optional laser light here with the blue accentuations for even more high beam performance. The front grille already very sporty with the vertical fins here, huge double kidney. At the moment they are closed for more wind efficiency and they can be opened on demand than on the inside. And the lower part already with a sporty touch, but you soon see that here the lower part is where the differences happen between the M550i and the true M model, the M5, which is right here. And here we go, the M5, same headlamps, but then the front grille is different. It is always open and has a different styling right here, so it looks even more aggressive. And then the biggest change is here in the lower end, wider area, wider opening. So this is then the, you know, the most prominent styling detail in lower area central and also left and right when you compare both vehicles. This is by the way also the competition model, 25 horsepower more and also some other additional features then. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Welcome here, the engine part, 4.4 liter V8 for both vehicles. They do share the same block, but they have different parts. You see it already here from the outside in the front area. Remember this one and we'll soon take a look at the M5. So they do also use different parts. Acceleration difference is a little less than four seconds in the acceleration fear here for the M550i and just over three seconds here for the M5 model. So yeah, around the half second difference, zero to 100 kilometers or zero to 60 miles an hour. In horsepower figures, it's 530 versus 600 horsepower or 625 horsepower here in the competition model. Both all wheel drive, but the M5 has the option in the infotainment system, you can choose it also to go rear wheel drive only on demand. And you can obviously see that they do also use different parts you can literally see that from the outside. So somewhat similar, but also a little bit different. I always wanted to have one of these, these computer key fobs, and I really always wanted to have two of these, and now I have it. <laughs> so here you can always see if you have close the vehicle, for example, this would be really important to me, or the range, um, or the, you know, you can set on the AC and something. It's actually cool and also usable, practical information, because the color says here, it's. Bernina Grey Amber versus Frozen Bluestone Metallic. And this here is the Bernina Grey on the M550i. It's a metallic color. And then the Frozen Bluestone Metallic is a matte color. You also hear that. I really love matte colors and in that way it's also really stylish. You also maybe know the, um, the Grey Magno color by Mercedes. This comes very close to that one. However, here the new Bernina Grey available with the facelift is also really striking. Which one do you like better color-wise by the way? Isn't that great to see here next to each other both with the rear? 
BMW, by the way, calls their offerings to the customer that you can now pick like EV, plug-in hybrid, or petrol engine, now also in future for different models. They call it power of choice. But this one here is rather, I would say, choice of power. <laughs> what about the powerhouse exhaust? It's beginning with the M5. True exhaust, big diffuser here. This one is really real exhaust. And even no job for the outer fuel effect exhaust police here in the M550i because I mean, there's this beauty on the outside, but you see the real exhaust comes right there and it just basically covers it on the outside. So I would not call this one fake. So I think also a very elegant but yet sporty solution and let's say a slight diffuser style. 19 or 20 inch wheels for both vehicles, but then the tires are wider for the M5. So in the front we have 275 mil and in the rear 285 mil. So in the front that's 30 millimeters wider and the rear 10 millimeters wider than in the M550i. And also styling elements. We have the air curtain right here in the top part. This air curtain element also, you know, design wise here in the top part. This is placed a little bit lower with the M550i. And here side mirrors have you know, this additional aerodynamic element right there. This looks a little bit more spectacular. Trunk area, we only show you once. It's the same for both. And here we go. The length is about one meters 15 or 45 inches. And you can easily also house a cabin trolley here in the vertical way. So very well usable. Of course, you would need to go for the touring version if you want more flexibility, but that's not available as an M5. Now to the interiors and door closing sound first. Hmm, awesome, that sounds really good. First, the M550i. We have a dark styling here for that one today. Soft materials right there. Then you have an M550i entry badge and also already the M steering and the sportier design. In this case, also with the heated function. As for seats, by the way, with the BMW 5 Series, you get a new facelifted Sensatec seat in black, beige, or brown. This is really cool. High-grade leatherette with a just great quality, perforated structure. However, this seat is not available here for the M models, neither for the M550i nor for the M5. You get a sportier seat right there. And in Europe, you can also get a sport seat for the M550i in fabric. This, however, the end between option and in the US, you only have that choice here at the moment. Great if they would also introduce that sensor tech seat here for the performance models. Let's get inside and seating comfort is actually quite good. I mean, you're in the 5 Series is a full size sedan, at least for my taste or for European taste. And find a good seating position here and one with a 6 or 6 with 1, enough headroom left as well. Interior overview, set the image line to purple so you can differentiate the cars here, the M550i. Both M Performance and the True M model get the bigger screen setup, which is otherwise an option, 12.3 inch left and right. Also updated with a new facelift on the, you know, the infotainment system here, also Android Auto and Apple CarPlay support both. Now, let's put myself here in the rear. As a tall adult, no problem. Four tall adults work headroom wise and also knee room wise here when I'm driving. Not plenty of useless space here. The seats are quite thick actually. Yo, sick yo. But overall, also a nice and comfortable position in the rear. And now the M5. We have a bright styling here today, which is, of course, a really nice color combination, especially with exterior and interior color, which is really corresponding in a way, I think. M5 competition badge right there. The steering wheel more or less the same, but we have additional control stages. And then the M1 and M2 button, where you can individualize your driving settings and have them as hotkeys. The seats here are having the same base form and then they have some other nuances. First of all, different color choice, cool bright styling. However, this is only in the animal skin pack again and this M5 badge can also be illuminated then. And yay, seat belts here with a special M colors. Seating is the same. However, here the interior is a little bit different. First of all, we have a different color scheme, but you can also get that then for the M550i. But here the instruments, when I turn on the engine, so they have special M instruments because you can also pick the different M modes, for example, or also have then the M setup. So these are the M specific things. And here in the setup, you can see, you can then pick actually what you want to have for your M1 or M2 mode. And this is also a way when you, for example, turn off the ESC. So wait a little bit, here we go. And then we can go back here and then pick the two wheel drive mode 
to basically cancel the all-wheel drive. But this is always connected with ESC off, so this is only for closed circuit or parking lot <laughs> and so on. For safety reasons, most of the time, keep it with the all-wheel drive. Oh, blue ambient lighting, that's typical Thomas style. And the special things are rather than here in the lower area, different shifting lever. It's an automatic shifting lever, but has, let's say, manual style, because that way is reverse and that way is driving mode. So it's a mix of manual and automatic from the feeling. Here on the top part, you change the shifting characteristics, talking more about that while we drive the vehicle. And then here, these two mode switches, first of all, from the setup where you can individualize the hotkeys. And then M mode is where you can deactivate or you know, draw back assistant systems. Overall, some kind of technical overkill, you have to get used to it a little bit, but this is also supposed to be like this tech machine. Welcome to Thomas's active driving performance lounge <laughs> with the comparison. And we'll start directly with the BMW M5 most sensation. I'll put it here to the M mode, then driving assistance systems are drawn back. And I can also put here the M custom modes, then everything is sportiest, but I put it to the automatic shifting. So we have the best performance there, but I set it here to the shifting up latest. So this will be really, really interesting. We're starting at about 30 kilometers an hour and let the hell out of this vehicle. That's 200. <laughs> 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. Oh my God. Wow, in this, uh, you know, special sport shifting mode. It's so already like bam, 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 hammering in the gears. What a performance and acceleration here. Just over three seconds. Really amazing. Um, yeah, and yet you can also go back to this manual shifting one. Then you always shift yourself and the car stays in the gear even when it hits the rev limiter, like this you hear it. No shifting up. Then it drops down the RPM, of course, sometimes because of power curve. I just want to show you that you have this mode where the car sticks in that gear no matter what. And so shifting yourself, of course, is also a lot of fun. Wow. So much fun. And of course, really great brakes here. We have the optional carbon ceramic brakes. Whew, this is really a re adrenaline rush. Well, now we're in the tunnel. Let's lower the window. Shift down. Nice, nice, nice. So cool. Yeah, indeed, great sound. In the US version, the sound will be even better. In the EU, the our exhaust notes are already way more restricted. Oh, there's a Benz Cabriolet coming up. R129, 129. It's actually a very interesting generation there, especially when it's not over-tuned or something, when it's more kept original. But here, of course, with our 625 horsepower, no one can actually overtake us. At least we just let people overtake. Interesting, by the way, that the suspension here in the competition model, even seven millimeters lower, and you can use it as an everyday driver. This does work. However, you do feel that the suspension is definitely stiffer than in the, for example, M550i. It is bearable, definitely. You have some comfort losses, but as I said, you can have it as a daily driver, no problem, actually. And you know, the special axle setup here, also by BMW M, wow, make the car so sporty, especially in the corners. Yeah, that's really, really cool. You can also set the steering feedback individually, by the way. And whew, yeah, when you're coming to a halt here, a little moment of silence until the next acceleration. By the way, here in the shifting modes, set here at the Shifting lever here now, 30 kilometers an hour, fourth gear already, but really smoothly and early shifting up and so on. However, if you set it to this, you know, third level or even already second level, car is all automatic shifting down a gear, keeping it in the lower gears. And also when you're just cruising and so on, definitely, you know, keeping the low gear and shifting up very, very late. So if you want, automatic shifting but the sportiest way then you would set it here to the third level where all the white um, you know 
signs are filled up. You are also seen on the shifting lever. The contrast to that would be when just one line is basically filled, then it's more you know, yeah, relaxed shifting. So in a way then you don't even have to change the driving modes. You can also you know, stick in non-M driving modes, have everything activated and just shift the characteristic by the car, literally by the shifting mode here at the shifting lever. That's also what it's meant to do. And now one more acceleration with shifting ourselves. <laughs> oh, that's, that was 80 to 180. And you can see the ref limiter also in the head out display in that mode. That's of course really, really helpful and so you can precisely time your shifts. Am I on a racetrack? No, it's German Autobahn, but sometimes it's like it's like that, but of course safety first as well. Always keeping a distance in the, to the front of us when you're driving really fast. Yeah, that's the most important thing you can do. Um, it gets quite loud here also at higher speeds. Um, that's notably. Looking forward if that's different in the M550i. Um, yeah, something like the AMG and the true M models, they have maybe some weight savings and so on, and then not most focus on sound dampening and so on. But here at one, 150 kilometers an hour, that's then, you know, more silent. But you also want to hear something of that engine. Wow, and the cool thing is here with high displacement, eight cylinders, then you can also sometimes accelerate in higher gears. Of course, it won't give the best performance, but I sometimes do that just, you know, to basically experience the old school big engines and see like, oh, there's still something happening, although we're in high gear. And then when you're in high gear, of course, you have this very low frequency, sonorous sound, which is reminding you of, yeah, that's where it used to be. <laughs> and now agile driving up Autogefühl's peak. Let's see how the M5 performs here. I mean, we're in the, I'd say, full-size sedan segment. So there's a lot of weight we carry around with us, but due to the suspension setup, great steering and nice feeling and so on. Yeah, this car still feels somewhat light. Of course, at some point you can't deny the weight anymore. That's of course a natural thing. Um, steering feel, by the way, I think could be it could be a little bit more feedback. That would be cool. So it is overall good and also feels quite natural and so on. But um, they are like the, for example, the Audi setups a little bit better than in the, in the RS models. So here, especially in the you know, in the low degree area, this could then be, yeah little bit stiffer or feel, feeling a little more progressive definitely but here this car handles so well doesn't lean or roll at all and remember the m5 does not offer the rear axis steering that is available with the m550i that would be something to consider definitely and i'm also looking forward how the m performance model then so this one here the true m model the m performance model let's see how this one um, performs in here with the rear axle steering. And what's also interesting here, when we put the DSC off and then configure and drive, now I'm in the two wheel drive mode. You have to have some practice doing that. So most often you don't do it while driving. And for example, then here, two wheel drive mode. <laughs> I can do this then around the hairpin corner. And the thing is the two wheel drive mode is connected with ESC off. So it's not recommended to do that on public roads here at very, very slow speeds, of course, and was looking ahead. Um, so always safety first, but the car is capable of doing so. So if you have closed circuit or something, you can still do that. You still have the possibility, but bear in mind, this car has so much power. And remember on the very first driving event of the initial launch or here of the M5, a lot of experienced guys were literally crashing the vehicle in this mode. It, it just has so much power. You know, and you have to be able to control that. So most of the time, I would also really recommend to leave it in the four-wheel drive mode here. But what a fun driving experience. Now the M550i, we put it in the Sport Plus one and also to the left in the Manuelle Schaltgasse. Listen and repeat, Manuelle Schaltgasse. 
<laughs> like the manual shifting alley. And we also start at 30 kilometers an hour. It's, you know, more or less same eight cylinder block, but of course changes. Can it keep up, keep up with the M5? Let's go. That's 200 kilometers now, 125 miles now. Wow. I mean, that felt really, really good. Also, good all wheel drive performance, rear wheel bias. The suspension is awesome. It's a little bit softer than with the M5, definitely, but handles so well here also at high speed. You feel, especially com uh, in comparison to the com competition package, that this one here also sits a little bit higher. But this one here can do both. What an, what an excellent compromise, you know, and you can drive that sport at the same time you put it back in the normal shifting mode or you go back to the normal comfort mode, then the car is more silent, more relaxed. I feel also it's a little bit more silent. Maybe it's also a thing of the carbon fiber roof in the M5 or something that doesn't insulate that well. That might be a reason for that. Brakes, we don't have the carbon uh, ceramic brakes here, but they're still quite good in performance. Not, you know, that powerful though. Not that you would miss any braking point here or something. So the difference between two the two vehicles is actually bigger than expected. And of course here, this one is the better overall price performance car and so on. That's already clear before doing the review, you know. But both are a lot of fun actually, but there is really huge difference in the whole attitude of the two vehicles. That is really surprising, surprising to me. The M5 always says like attack, 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 even in normal driving mode. And here you have two vehicles in one. Here in the comfort mode, it's more or less like a normal BMW 5 Series running straight on the motorway. Everything is relaxed and so on. Let's compare the sound here. Sport mode once again, shifting down. Let's see, silence. Also nice A-cylinder sound, of course not that crackling as we have in, in the true M5. The all-wheel drive, or like the all -wheel, all -wheel steer, rear axle steering, <laughs> this is really remarkable at lower speeds then, turns in the opposite direction in the rear wheels and the front wheels, and here at higher speeds it gives more stability as it turns in the same direction. And it really feels very well, this BMW adaptive suspension one of the best suspensions there is on the market. It's so good that you don't miss an air suspension at all, that it's in a way somehow also even better than some of the air suspensions of the competitors. This is an awesome vehicle. The overall package, of course, you know, is better with the M550i. And the thing is really, soon also the agile driving part is to come up that we can compare it, you know, with the, um, you know, up driving up the hill. When you're driving this here on the motorway and you're running straight, it will give you more comfort on the long run. So if you more seek this compromise between sportiness and comfort, then this here is the vehicle for you. And the more you think about it and the more you look on paper and the more you appreciate comfort, then you will surely land, you know, surely end up with using this one here. But then again, when you are freshly in the vehicle, just start driving, and the emotions take over. Then you think, ah, shouldn't it be the M5? <laughs> yeah, that's always the thing, right? And one more acceleration when we are already at speed. Plop, that's also, also 80 to almost 190 kilometers. So, yeah, speed-wise, acceleration-wise, it's really hard to pick the difference. Yes, the M5 is a little bit faster, definitely, but I mean, that V8 power is always there already when we have the M550i and such a great suspension. Definitely suspension setup is more likable here in the M550i because it considers the comfort without losing control or handling or something. Yes, the M5 is stiff and will perform better on the racetrack, but on the road, definitely the compromise, the setup here is better for the M550i it will still be very tricky. This is not over yet here. <laughs> At the moment, I'm in like, yeah, for what purpose, you know? Um, if I seek more comfort, probably this one, and 
maybe like you should go for the M550i, but you still want the M5, maybe something like this. Let's drive this one up the hill and see how it goes. Now putting in sport mode plus here with the M550i and driving up the hill. Oh, this then sounds somewhat familiar from the V8. And rear axle steering here. If you have the dynamic handling package in the US or the Adaptive M Suspension Professional in the EU, then you also have the rear axle steering. And this is really helpful at lower speeds. The rear axle comes around a little bit more, also reduce the turning circle. So a lot of driving fun here. This feels then as it would have a shorter wheelbase. So in that way, by that option, makes the M550i better to handle for parking in and out and also is in that way, especially in very narrow corners, a little bit more fun. However, you are always stuck with the all-wheel drive then here. You still have great acceleration and when you're under the sport mode and the RPMs are turned up high, really flawless. The suspension is definitely softer, a little smoother. So the M5 gives you more aggression, also a little bit more sound. This one here, even when I'm at these speeds here, just a little smoother also from the sound dampening and so on, but performance-wise, wow. Also really great. This goes so quick forward. And when we are in the hairpin corner here, yeah, on the one hand, we don't have a rear-wheel drive option. On the other hand, rear axle steering. And I feel that this, you know, makes the rear coming around. But I mean, yeah, this corner here is some symbolic for the difference between the M550i and the M5. This one, you're already really sporty, but the M5 is just the pinnacle of sportiness than here for the 5 Series, so way more aggressive. This one does deliver you sporty driving fun, but you don't immediately come into this harsh adrenaline rush, you know. This one here is more or less a relaxed sportiness with a lot of power. The M5 says, you know, like, let's go, let's attack. Wow, this was really exciting. Which one would I take home and which one would you take home? Really looking forward for your comments. The thing is, I mean, exterior-wise, they both come very close. No doubt about that. And also depending on the color and the styling and so on. The matte color of the M5 today is really, really awesome. Yeah, I really love that. But I mean, both colors are absolutely striking. From the interior, the M5, a little bit of an adjustment overkill. Maybe that could have been, you know, done a little bit easier because it's not, let's say, a straightforward user interface of how many things you can control there. On the other hand, you have the possibility to control a lot right there. Another big technology difference is that for the M550i, you can get the rear axle steering. So, yeah, you know, in this dynamic handling package in the US or the Adaptive M Suspension Professional in the EU. This is really a crucial difference because it makes handling the car, parking in and out and so on, and also U-turns, turning circles, so much easier in everyday driving. And also at lower speeds, it gives a lot of agility, faking a shorter wheelbase. This is a lot of fun to drive a car with a rear axle steering. However, it can feel somewhat a little bit unnatural. And then the M5, you know, feels more purest, more, yeah, direct, in the sporty so i can also understand that they did not go for that performance wise of course half a second faster for the m5 in the acceleration figure both are really powerful on the motorway but more the difference is the suspension setup and that the m5 always says like you know let's go let's attack and to me it was really surprising that the difference between the two vehicles is bigger than expected before that i mean price performance winner is of course the m550i that was clear beforehand but to me, I was also expecting that I was clearly say, I'll definitely take this one and goodbye. But I really have to say, the M5 is more fun, more sporty fun, on the cost of a little bit of comfort. So the question is what you like, what you prefer. Of course, the extra price is not really justified on the one hand. Hmm. But if I could pick one right now, maybe it's more like either go for the top for the M5 or then go for a real price performance model. My favorite BMW 5 Series model I would also recommend to you is the 540i. That's the six cylinder already. Get it as rear wheel drive. And on the inside, then the new SensorTech facelift seats in, for example, in beige or in brown. 
to have a nice color contrast. That would be the ideal price performance tip for today. But we need these two here. I love the concept better of the M550i, but somehow the M5 got me hooked. <laughs> so what about you? How good is the all new BMW 5 Series and how does it rate against the main competitors, Mercedes E-Class or the electric one, the Mercedes EQE? We're going to find out here today in our extensive driving review with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go. Here you can see all the 5 Series version, no matter if electric or petrol or diesel or plug-in hybrid, will more or less look the same. They're building on the very same platform. And here on our channel, we'll keep you updated with all the different versions. This one here is the i5 M60. So this is the M Performance model and also with the M Sport Package Pro. That means the black frame around the double kidney. And also here the M logo. Lower part also when you have the normal M Sport Package looks sportier here. And mineral white is this exterior color. We have more colors for you. One of my favorite colors is here the frozen pure gray. There's also a deep frozen gray available. It would be a little bit darker, but here in the bright one, I think, yeah, this is what I really like. The matte paints here, by the way, you can always hear it when you feel them, actually. The advantage is actually that they look cool, yes, and when it rains, it almost gets cleaned by itself. The disadvantage is when you have minor scratches, you cannot really easily you know, polish them or so, then you just have to repaint. So that's the downside. Well, and then another pro and con, the extra price here from a German configurator is 3,750 euros. But then again, all the matte paints are now bio-based. So when you pick a matte paint, it is actually more sustainable. So you could say like, you know, when you argue at home, yeah, I need to go for the matte paint because, you know, more sustainment and so on. <laughs> and this is here the i5 M60 in fire red, so different color. Of course, you can also get all the colors for all the different powertrains. And this is also equipped with some more carbon fiber details, for example, at the side mirror. Or also in the rear, you can see this small spoiler in carbon fiber. And one more color for you is Brooklyn Gray, also one of my favorite colors. And here we can also see the direct comparison. Here with our i5 M50 and the M Sport Package Pro, we have the outer frame in black. And also here the inside part looks a little bit different. And here, this one here is the E-Drive 40. So that means the rear wheel drive standard or base electric version, base i5. And then this one only has the M Sport Pack. That means we have the sportier lower accentuations, but the outer kidney frame is still then bright. I think that really looks better. And also the inside of the double kidney, I think just looks more classic BMW here with the vertical fins. So if you ask me, compare this styling here, right? Or it's, it's on, on your left, right? On your left and to this right. So on your left, the styling, I like this one way better than this one here. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. Here, when I give a little bit of shade to the front double kidney, you can get this optional, the iconic low. Then the frame is also illuminated. Adaptive LED, main headlamp unit, then the daytime running light here, or when you hit the turning indicators or hazard lights, they replace it and have this pulsing effect. And turning indicators in the rear, very wide. Yeah, this is definitely visible. The length is now at 5 meters 6 or 199 inches. That's 10 centimeters or 4 inches longer than the predecessor. Wheels from 18 inch to maximum 21. These are the biggest 21 inch wheels in this M design. Really impressive indeed. And you can also get these black contrasts here, the side mirrors, also in the lower part. You can see it has a very high contrast, especially to the mineral white color. In general, if you compare the BMW to the Mercedes, whereas Mercedes, both with the E-Class and also especially with the EQE, the EV version, goes more in the round direction. This one here more has this classic German angular styling. Very nice indentation here of the Five logo, by the way. What do you think about the design and also especially if you compare it to the competitors? Typical three box sedan styling I like and also the angular shapes, really widely drawn tail lamps. And as for technology, let's start with the suspension. You have base suspension. You can go for an M Sport suspension, a fixed one also comes with the M Sport Pack. Then you can also optionally go for the Adaptive Suspension Professional. That one always comes in a package with adaptive dampers and also rear exit steering. Goes 2.5 degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels, reduces the turning circle. And for the M60 here, you can get the Adaptive M 
suspension professional. That one also adds an anti-tilt control that it stays more upright. And to be even more specific, the i5, so all the electric versions and the plug-in hybrids, because of more weight on the rear axle, always also get air suspension at the rear axle. And this vehicle here is also mineral white, but it does not have the M Sport Pack. That means there's no black accentuations here. Here we have the air curtain, wind goes through there, and a little bit cleaner look all around, less sporty maybe, but I feel it maybe looks even a little bit sleeker that way without the M Sport package, or what do you think? And also a crucial difference, this one here, without the M Sport Pack and also in the eDrive 40 version, so let's say the base electric version, has a CD value of 0.23. Whereas the i5 M60 has 0.25, so there is a big difference in aerodynamics. And this one here is also 170 kilograms lighter because you only have the electric motor at the rear axle. So in our driving part later on, we'll do a comparison of consumption between the all-wheel drive and the rear-wheel drive model. And we'll also do a special feature on the highway assistance system. So there's a new autonomous driving feature where I just drive with my hands off and it's even allowed. So more to come in the driving part very soon. Super interesting also here in the side profile. First of all, 20 inch wheels, so a little bit smaller, but still large, right? And then here we have chrome frames around the windows, a little bit more classic styling here also with the five indentation. And also in the lower part here, not a high gloss black in this non-super sporty version. And I think that's even more curious. See, look at that, you know, when the light is shimmering right here, the structures inside, you can really feel it and see how the light is changing. So I feel that this styling is even cooler and fits the vehicle more. What do you think? And the rear of the base version, especially here in the lower part, here a little bit more silver contrast. And then you have a rather matte black in the lower part, whereas the M Sport versions would once again have this high gloss black diffuser style. So here, once again, a little bit more subtle. And I really have to say, really fell in love with this more simple styling here. This is the BMW app, and here we can show you that remote parking is possible, tap and hold. So for example, when it would be in a narrow parking lot or something, I can just control the car by my phone, so no one is driving here. I'm not faking it, so here I can press backward. Uh, there we go, yeah. And then I can ease the car out. So let's think about, you have a, maybe like an old parking garage that is really narrow, where I can hardly open the doors because it was built for more narrow cars. That's the easy way, and then you can also take your car for a walk. Oh, good boy, good boy. Yeah, he, he, was, he was, you know, early in dog school, you know, and really learned to, you know, to drive by my side. <laughs> I love that feature. Yeah. To open and close the vehicle, use the smartphone app, or you can also use the classic key fob. I'm glad it's still the choice. Then here on the left side, this is metal here in the M Sport or in the M60. So it's actually heavier and interesting, actually. Flush door handles here, but they still give a haptic feedback when you open them like this. So at the moment, the car is closed. There we go. That's open. You just need to hold a smartphone in your hand. It's also possible. Door closing sound. Yeah, I love that. Let's do it again. Mm, beautiful, very solid door closing sound. Inside of the doors, soft touch material, all structured, then it's even softer here a little bit for the elbows. And the window levers, they are mainly just black plastic, just have this, you know, this contrast on the top part. And you can see here this interior bar already begins right here, and there you can set the memory seating and so on, optional bowels and brick and sound system. This one here is also the M Sport interior which is also standard for the M60. Then you have the M steering wheel with the contrast stitches on the inside, sportier form. However, this one then is still animal material. The base steering wheel would also be vegan. That's also a step forward now. Then the seats, either you get sport seats as standard, I'll soon going to show you them, or these here are the optional comfort seats. They are a little bit more open in the upper area and also a little bit more comfy in the lower area. What I love, by the way, here, look at that. This is the lengthenment for the lower seating area. I pulled it all the way out and there is no gap left. So when you pull it out, there's no gap left where you can you know, have like crumbles inside or whatever. So it's easy to clean and looks also clean. This is also the Veganza material, so it's completely animal-free, super soft, and also 
as durable or even a little bit more durable than the animal skin alternative. And the seating comfort is indeed superb. So one of the best at the moment in the sedan segment. Same material is used in the 7 Series, by the way. The only difference is that the 7 Series might have a little bit higher Einsatzhöhe. Listen and repeat, Einsatzhöhe. So a little bit more dampening underneath. The main thing is that both are available also here, perforation and also with the ventilation. That's, I think, pretty cool. The sport seat have a little bit more side support if you drive sport here. These here, however, the comfort seats will deliver more comfort. So overall, I think I would go for these here. As for headroom with 189 or 6 for 2, still have headroom left here. This then the one with the glass roof and the, yeah, I have to push it forward actually because it rolls in in the front. So you have more headroom in the rear. So this one you have fixed glass roof, but with the shade when it gets really hot, I think it's very important. As an alternative, I heard that the US market still gets a small roof that you can actually also open. It won't be all the way then, but at least you can still open it. But there are always pros and cons about all different kinds of fixed roof, fixed glass roof, and also the openable glass roof. Um, yeah, this could actually fill an hour itself talking about the pros and cons there. And these here are the sport seats as they would be standard for the M Sport Pack or for the M60. Here you can see the Veganza on the interior, sport seat form, perforation, and on the sides here in the top part, there you have Alcantara inserts. And they are also perforated and the M colors here, red, blue and the bright blue, they shine basically from the background. And the same also accounts for the head restraint, Alcantara covering, perforated and also with this shiny background. Interior cockpit overview, you have this curved screen, but then 12.3 on the left, 14.9 inch on the right side. You have also, you can get this one here, this light bar, this ambient light bar, and it also switches according to the driving modes. For example, if you go to the sport mode, then here it turns red. The only thing I don't really understand, and it's better in the 7 series, for example, here, this split, I think a light bar would need to go through on the very same horizontal level. Here it's kind of like here and oh, where is it? Ah, there it continues. You know what I mean? Here you can also get a carbon fiber decal element, but also different decal elements are available. Soft touch of on the top dashboard and so much different, for example, to a Mercedes E-Class interior or a Mercedes EQE. So the layout is really very different. Steering wheel still with some physical buttons. It's a mix, so to speak. Right side here for the volume. BMW OS 8.5 here, different home screen as well. And then you also have this app view where you can access everything. Yeah, it's really a lot. You have a YouTube app now, you can watch Bundesliga and you also have the air console games for some gaming experiences, for example. And vehicle apps is always, for example, interesting because in the live vehicle app, there you also have the consumption data and so on. Then the Apple CarPlay integration looks like this. Wireless, both also for Android Auto. And you can also have the maps here in the left instrument screen. Here, the climate unit is always in the lower part. And it's actually very cool here, the cool seats for the Veganza perforate material. However, to access them, actually, it's more complicated than with physical controls. Digital instruments, when I start up the vehicle, oh, you have the startup sound and then simple and clean, left side speed right side and the power or then here for the electric version you can see also the recharging and you can also change the whole um, content you want to see in the middle part that's possible also then you know like apple maps and so on this is the car internal map and you can also get a proper head-up display in the front you have inductive charging pad here also with some cooling holes however the disadvantage is it looks like two but just the left side is for the recharging the right side is just for storage basically. Then adaptive cup holders, two USB-C chargers, and we have still this control lever here. There you can also control the infotainment system while driving and it also has a nice sound and still a normal volume jog right here. I like that. Here this is where you control the driving modes. This is to me a little bit too complicated to do that while driving because you have to click here and then in touchscreen or then use this one. So a separate control for that would be better, I feel. And you have this split opening, I always like that, for the storage right there. And listen to that, also with a nice closing sound. 
in here now. This is also the animal free steering wheel. It has different styling. We know it from the BMW iX because the iX had this form and now will also get as an update also the animal free material. It feels a little bit different but very similar. You wouldn't know it actually if you didn't you know if no one told you before. I feel it feels even a little bit softer and as I said earlier it is tested on at least the same durability actually. So it looks a little bit more futuristic I feel. Um, the other one the M Sport looks a little bit more sporty definitely but both have something definitely. Um, but this one of course then more animal friendly and very in interesting tip by the way you might remember this new EU law that when you exceed the speed, there's always this beeping and so on for very new vehicles. Mercedes were the first one to introduce a hotkey when you like hold the mute key. Here they did it in a similar way. So there's an exclusive information for you now here. Set that works on both steering wheels. Set and hold a little bit while driving. Then also this, you know, special assistant that is always beeping is deactivated. However, you have to set it each time the car starts up again. When you shut down the vehicle, start again. That is actually mandatory by law. That's the only thing that manufacturers can do is activate these hotkeys or short ways solutions to deactivate it quickly again. And here, by the way, also different decor element. This is like a dark wood with, you know, this shiny cover. Also not too bad. I usually prefer like matte open cell thing, you know, but um, yeah, definitely more Deco elements are available, of course. And here you can also see how this different steering wheel looks in the whole cockpit setting. Rear seating area, it does fit for tall elves also in the rear, but it is a pain of this segment that also counts for the competitors that considering the exterior length, you don't have so much space for your legs in the rear. Hmm. Again, considering the package. However, it would fit even better when I put the front seat a little bit higher than the recess here at the back part of the seat would fit, fit better, <laughs> would, foot, would fit better for the knees and also for my feet underneath the seat. What I found quite cool is that here we just have a USB-C charger and an iPad holder. It's actually a very easy and simple solution. The seating comfort itself is really good because of the soft material. This Veganza material is actually softer than the animal skin counterpart. And it is actually also in a passive way more breathable. I had recently a direct test so they don't get too hot that easily. Then in the front you also have the ventilation. Here in the middle part, cup holders, they are adaptive. So I'm also happy here with the build quality and so on. You can also fold down this ski hatch right here. Oh, there's my lunch bag. <laughs> See you later, lunch bag. And then in the lower part, we have a climate unit that is all digital. It looks clean, however. Yeah, I mean, I do prefer always manual climate ops, you know that. Um, but I think it's reasonably simple. You can also get rear seat heating, as you can see, and two more USB-C chargers. And just as a proof, so because they pull in this shade for the glass roof in the front, I still have headroom here also in the rear for tall passengers. And not to forget, also soft touch here for the rear doors on the inside. As for the trunk, wait a minute, what does ass have to do with the trunk? <laughs> with it, as for the trunk or the boot, <laughs> let's open it. We have 490 liters for the i5 or 520 liters for the combustion engine models. And you can see here, it's a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches in width. And the length is actually more than a 40 inches or a meter, it's like, 112 or 44 inches. So the difference is also the lower part. If you have a combustion engine model, then this one here is a little bit lower, but there's no space underneath. If you have a plug-in or i5, then you have some space underneath, but it's a little bit higher overall. And you can also fold the seats, unlock them right here and here, but then you either have to push it with the luggage, that's possible, or have to go around, then you can also load through. Does it frunk or not here in the electric versions? Let's lift it. No, it does not, but wow, largest <laughs> engine cover ever. Here also with some M carbon fiber styling. At least it looks good, but some frunk would have been cool, wouldn't it? Then let's talk about the different engine specs. Overall, the acceleration figure for the new 5 Series ranges from 7.5 seconds, slowest to 3.8 seconds. That is this one here, the i5 M60. Maybe later there will also be something else, like a true M version. We'll keep you updated with that. And there will also be a two-ring version if the sedan is not enough for you. 
overall they are pure petrol, pure diesel, plug-in hybrid petrol and the all-electric versions. The full engine lineup is really very wide. We have it in the pinned comment and also in the video description for you that you can check it out. Electric specific you get a battery of 81 kilowatt hours net. What concise range we can score with that we're going to find out today in our driving test later on. As for recharging less than 30 minutes from 10 to 80 percent state of charge. Difference in the two versions so far as a rear wheel drive version only that one then around six seconds in the excavation figure or this one here the all wheel drive electric version the M60 with 3.8 seconds in the excavation figure then one electric motor per axle but the rear one will always be the stronger one and there will also be an all-wheel drive electric version coming up which is not the M version so something in between. And now to the driving part of the all-new 5 Series. Oh wait, wrong vehicle. Acceleration first, i5 M60 all-wheel drive 3.8 seconds in the acceleration figure officially and what can we score? We go here to the sport mode, you can see here already the red accentuations. We use this empty parking lot. Let's go. Oh, oh, that was 90. Woo! Woo! And you also heard the iconic sounds. So uh, that is then whoo, that you have this sound feedback as well because there's obviously no sound feedback from the engine there. Wait a minute. If you ask yourself now, is that possible even quicker? Yes, it is. If I hold the boost pedal while rolling already, that's possible. Or if I do now stand still and launch control, left pedal here with my left foot, right pedal with my right foot. With the launch control and the boost function, you can get a little bit more torque even out of this vehicle. Let's try and see the difference. Michel, Michel? Oh, Michel bailed now. Uh, obviously, that, that was too much for him. Um, no, to be honest, he's filming uh, it uh, from, from the outside uh, for a reel. Anyway, let's go. Oh, that was more than 100 already. Whew. Wow, I mean, super quick in both cases, definitely. Here, just a little notch. An interesting thing is you don't get more horsepower, but just a little bit more torque out of the boost function or then here, the launch control here, boost function. Then for 10 seconds, I have this extra boost always available. Um, yeah. Again, launch control only when stationary, boost and also while rolling already. Whew. Wow, was there any difference? We have to check the time codes, but it also might vary then depending on where you are exactly. And then we continue driving uphill here. Wow, that's really a lot of artificial sound. However, you can also turn that off. I can also show that to you very soon, no problem. Here, one more time. Uphill. It, it doesn't even feel like going uphill because you have so much power here. Wow. Amazing. Then hammering the turning indicator. That's always a lot of fun. Let's just do it one more time. Ah, that sounds beautiful. And you can also accelerate out of the corner here very well. Look at how calm the steering remains. So you accelerate very hard, but you remain in control all the time. That's really cool. Then the steering feel, let's see, here in the sport mode. Reactions also from the low degree angle, actually, and also how it gets to the outside. Yeah, it feels actually quite cool. Let's see the difference in the driving modes. Yeah, switching the driving modes is actually not that easy to do, I feel. Always have to go this and then that one. So here, normal personal driving mode. Yeah, it's a little bit softer then. Let's go back. In sport again. Yeah, then have a little bit more feedback then. So overall quite happy with that. Did you also hear the side bolsters? Side bolsters, ah, with yeah, a with the sports mode. Ah, so a yeah, good remark from, from Michelle. Yeah, and sport in the personal mode gets a little bit wider, and then in the sport mode, yeah, they close a little bit in. That's uh, actually a nice feature. Yeah, pretty cool actually. Mm, nice. So slalom wise, stays really upright. Here we have the adaptive. M suspension. That means dampers are adaptive and there's also the anti-tilt control in the rear. And since this is the i5, we also have the rear axle air suspension. So yeah, suspension-wise is 
not a very easy logic here. There are so many different choices. So that's why I also went in depth to explain all of that. And we also have the 21 inch wheels here mounted. So the biggest ones that are available. So far the road is quite even and nice and so on. But let's also find out about the bumps and so on, if it gets really uncomfortable or something. But so far, he's actually quite nice. And the car feels lighter and sportier than the size or the weight might suggest. That's, of course, always something they want to achieve. These red traffic lights are probably only put here in Portugal to that you can do another sprint. Yeah. <laughs> the truth is um, they turn red when you're, when you're driving too fast. <laughs> Ah, well, I want to show you here my modes. When we're in, just in the personal mode and then accelerate. And you feel it's just a little bit then, you know. So when you're in sport mode, it's more enhanced. And also when you hit the throttle a little bit harder, then it is even more enhanced. To turn that off, actually, yeah, do stuff like this while driving is always a little bit, yeah, I don't know. Um, then you have to uh, search for that. You are in the vehicle apps and it's driving settings and then here iconic sounds off here by that and even when i'm then going into the sport mode i would then accelerate you see there's just nothing and if you prefer this or that it's really a matter of personal preference so tell me would you actually like it completely silent or would you actually prefer to have these iconic sounds on there we go and especially in sports mode I mean, when you don't hammer it that hard, then it's quite okay. So you can live with that in everyday driving life, no problem at all. So how does it feel from the previous generation 5 series? Although this one here is the electric one and the battery, and there wasn't a full electric one in the previous generation, they managed actually by that suspension setup and all the fine tunings that it does not feel heavier. So that is to me one of the key findings. And you might remember our i7 vs. 7 series review where we compared the petrol and the electric one and BMW really manages that their vehicles, when they're in the electric version or the combustion inversions, more or less feel the same. There is indeed not much difference in driving fun, agility and so on. And that's, I think, uh, a very, very good achievement. Remember with Mercedes comparing that, E-Class vs. EQE, they used a completely different platform. Yes, they also share parts, but there they really split their electric thing and their combustion engine thing, whereas BMW has this approach here to react a little bit quicker to the changing demand that they put everything on one platform. So then again, the wind efficiency here is not the best, especially if you go for one here in the M Sport. Um, so the CD value indeed varies a lot according to the package or the version you have on the exterior here with the 5 series so that might be also some tricky thing if you want to have it more efficient while driving do not go for the m sport pack the non m sport pack versions the base versions will be more aerodynamic very important to know for that we will later on also drive the rear wheel drive pure version then you can also you know compare the acceleration and so on of course, here you can use the power at any time, but you don't have to, actually, if you don't want to. The overall driving feeling here is very calm and collected. It is that typical business sedan we know from BMW. And if you compare it now to the 7 Series, for example, how can you really compare that as for the driving feeling? It is actually kind of similar. The 7 Series feels bigger, feels heavier. Here, the seats already deliver superb comfort. Maybe the 7 Series seats are a little bit more plush as for the so-called Einsatzhöhe, as I said. But here you pay so much less money, although it's not a cheap vehicle at all, but you already get some kind of 7 Series feeling. You know? So I feel that the difference between 5 and 7 Series has also become now a little bit closer with this generation. At the same time, you have some of the agility of the 3 Series, also, like with the Mercedes E-Class, I feel that E-Class and 5 Series in their model lineup overall are somewhat the sweet spot. That becomes obvious, especially while driving these ones here. Then let's here test always some assistance systems on the countryside road. 
I have set the active cruise control. So this is primarily meant to do on the motorway. We'll also give you a special insight on that as for the automatic lane change and this you know, autonomous feature. But here when you set it like on the normal tone, even here on the countryside road, where it's not like the specialty thing, usually meant for the motorway driving, it follows the lane very well. It keeps the car centered even if you don't steer it yourself. So the elaboration of the assistance system is really on a high level already. Noise insulation wise, it's also super silent in here. Later again with a little bit higher speed, but here at lower speeds, you hardly hear anything from the outside environment really gives you a very very calm feeling together with the superb superb comfort here of the Veganza seats and even if you wouldn't have seat cooling they would remain quite cool but here I can for example set like level one of seat cooling um, by that this is by the way also an advantage if you compare it to the 7 series the 7 series actually does not offer seat ventilation together with the perforated Veganza seats strange decision definitely but you have it here with the 5 series so yeah i mean even going long mileage here i can very well imagine that great now we've found a destroyed road that is about to be redone therefore it's really bumpy and so on but remember 21 inch wheels and usually these large wheels mean no comfort at all you know so i always say like go for smaller wheels but here Although it's a destroyed road, it feels like nothing. So I'm really impressed by this suspension. I mean, it's not a full air suspension. Even here in the electric one or the plug-in hybrid and so on, it is just a rear axle air suspension. But you don't feel that. It is still a very comfortable ride. So the adaptive dampers here by BMW have always been very good. They have been so good that usually you do not miss an air suspension. So even if you would have a combustion engine version where you have no rear axle air suspension and so on they will do absolutely fine of course base suspension would also be interesting in the test later on usually these test vehicles here are very very high spec but here with the adaptive suspension not only does it fulfill sporty purposes you also consider how it's, it's not getting super loud although it was this construction work here work here so sporty side definitely did deliver but also here on the comfort side yeah I and mean, if you want it even softer then you would indeed go with little smaller wheels 21 inch wheels also have the disadvantage that they sometimes get easily scratched and so on you know so uh, I wouldn't maybe like 20 as a maximum compromise or something uh, but yeah because 21 is definitely super super large more features here for example augmented reality feature I have here the camera view and also an arrow then right here when I have the car internal GPS set so that's a display arrow that they have to turn around and here we can also experience the rear axle steering so although the car is long has a long wheelbase and so on rear axle steering makes it really possible to have narrow turning circles that's actually pretty cool and you also feel that the rear comes a little bit around so to speak so that these guys pass <laughs> there we go and also when you accelerate out for example you feel i mean it doesn't feel too artificial in this case because they don't have the widest degree angle and that's always the discussion when you have a wider angle it feels a little bit more artificial then again you can reduce the turning circle more um, so they didn't want to exaggerate it in a way uh, but still it's a very cool feature to have at low speeds you feel it when you drive a little bit faster it moves in the parallel direction anyway so then you wouldn't have this effect you have more like more stability than in this case but definitely very cool feature to have it to make life a little bit easier especially when parking in and out and so on and yeah it doesn't uh, take anything away from the fun while driving noise insulation when being here on the motorway around 120 kilometers an hour so like 70 miles an hour it's really good here the tarmac is a little bit rougher here a little bit more tire noise the one we were on before was a little bit less will change soon again but the overall you know wind noise and so on is really low feels super comfortable this vehicle here I switched the vehicle now just to test some more variety is by the way equipped with these sport seats they are also good but definitely I feel it now especially on long motorway journeys rather 
take the comfort seats that just bring you that extra amount of comfort. These ones here are a little bit stiffer, so the comfort seat is a little bit softer than in the dampening, so they overall just give you more comfort. And especially since we have this electric feature where in the sport mode, for example, they get a little bit closer, it's also not a problem that they in general have a little bit less side support than the ones I'm sitting on here. So my choice would be the comfort seats and then probably in the bright Vigan sedan. First consumption test, we ended up with about 19 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour. So that would mean a real world concise range of 430 kilometers or 270 miles. And we're also testing the assistance system. And there's big news coming up right now. First of all, here you know the adaptive cruise control and the active lane keeping assist, told you about that. But now it's also possible to get an extra package for the plus package. And in front of us is also a vehicle. And first of all, I can take my hands off and I can also look into the mirror, look to the left to initiate a lane changing actually automatically. Let's see, let's try it again here. There we go, so I'm looking into the side mirror and the car is automatically changing the lane. I did not do anything with my hands, I just looked into the mirror. What is not possible is that I just look into the mirror right now and then the car is changing the lane. That, that doesn't work that way, so the car first has to give me the offer that you know, the situation is ready to do that. You might ask yourself, why would that be necessary in a way here overall? I mean, it is a little bit more relaxed just to keep your hands down and it is not meant that you take out your smartphone or something and start texting or whatever. So because it's still level two, that means you are still responsible. So when I have an accident, it's my responsibility. Difference to the level three autonomous driving that Mercedes, for example, is offering. There, the car is irresponsible. However, that one is restricted to 60 kilometers an hour, you know, like 30 miles an hour. Here, however, this one works until 130 kilometers an hour or 80 miles an hour. And that's, of course, a better usage because I can also do it here at higher speeds here on the motorway. It will be allowed so far in the US, in Canada, and also in Germany. In Germany, they also got a special allowance for that. That is also something very new because so far it is not allowed at all. Here now you can see a car changes into our lane. The vehicle is doing that very well and yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed how smooth the whole system is working. So there are no hectic movements, everything goes via the flow and sometimes you know you need to get used to these systems or you may be like I don't really trust in the vehicle or so, but because everything is so smooth and controlled, you really have full trust in the vehicle and you know, you don't think, oh, oh my god, oh my god, what's, what's going on? No, it, it's actually kind of relaxing, really. So the Amelanthia is not moving over. It is kind of weird, you know. The last time I, I've driven, check traffic to switch uh, so that I can yeah, check it, so I go over. Yeah, there we go. So um, the last time I've driven in such autonomous way, and it was at that point legal, in Germany actually was with the Tesla Model S, and that was 10 years ago. Um, yeah, then they realized that wasn't really up to, you know, they, they couldn't really do that in all situations. So that was disallowed then. <laughs> yeah, but now we are back here. Autonomous driving is still a long way ahead, definitely, you know, to go fully autonomous and also that the car is doing it all on its own. But here, this is definitely one of the next steps and it works here at reasonable speeds, you know. So, uh, yeah, definitely more relaxing to keep my hands down um, and maybe a little bit easier than when, you, when you're talking to someone, maybe to the camera, for example. So, now someone is overtaking us. We also have a blind spot monitor, by the way. Um, for my information, definitely not may maybe necessary for the car yet. Um, yeah, but once again, looking here, I can't do the change and when the next car would be in front of us, we need to overtake, then again, I can do the next overtaking action. So um, overall, I think the system works very, very well. So you might wonder why is this actually allowed and how do they keep track of the driver because, you know, I'm not supposed to take my smartphone and so on. Um, I'm actually being tracked by the vehicle and this works by analyzing my head and my eyes, you know, and 
when the car, for example, detects that I'm really super distracted, I mean, we, we can try that out, right? Maybe I do like, I just pretend to, you know, use my smartphone. No, there we go. Driver distraction detected, stay attentive. So then, there we go. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm still here. <laughs> so you see, that works really, really quickly. And we can do another test, actually. So now I'm closing one of my eyes. I'm still looking. And there's this infrared sensor. And it even works with sunglasses, actually. I can also show that very soon. But first of all here, one eye closed is okay. But now I'm doing something that's not allowed. Um, I just do it for you. I trust the vehicle just with my eyes closed. Don't do this, don't try it at home. Just want to see, check that. There we go. So the car is saying like, you know, first warning. And if I would then continue that, then it would actually at some time abort and also hit the brake automatically and so on and so on. And yeah, what, what about the, I mean, this could be like a use case, you know, where I can for the first time then also like change my glasses um, quickly like this. I don't need any, any help. So now sunglasses. See, there's no difference. Only if I would close my eyes behind my sunglasses, then again, it would be a problem. So, uh, yeah, very interesting how these systems are working technologically. Um, but you see that they are really working very flawlessly. Recently, it was the Audi RS3 here in Autogefühl. Now today, BMW said, hold my beer. We can do better with the all-new BMW 2 Series Coupe, the ultimate BMW sports car. Is it the compact racer? We'll find out. Here in the front part, we can see the new double kidney, really very wide and adaptive intakes here. So you see here, they are indeed moving. Then you can see in the technology pack, the optional technology pack, you can see here in the lower part, an additional spoiler lip for even better, better aerodynamics. This one here is the M240i X-Drive, the top sports model with the six cylinder, soon more to that engine as well. Well, these headlamps here, really impressive signature. You can see the daytime running light also will switch to the hazard lights or the turning indicators, the full size when you have this optional adaptive LED, which you can also get. The normal base LED lamps, they have a smaller signature than in the lower part. Technology-wise, by the way, also a lot of changes. It has a wider track, especially in the front, around six centimeters, around two inches. And the camber inclination has also changed, it's negative. So, you know, like, in extreme way, the wheels are like this, you know, and then you have a direct approach here when steering, but it's just half, you know, half of a degree, but still has a massive effect. And you can see here design-wise on the hood, especially if you look from the side, then, you know, this really massive power dome style. The length now at four meters, 54 or 179 inches here for the new two series coupe. Well, that's a wheelbase increase of about five centimeters or two inches. And the most important thing is this is derived from the three series platform, means rear wheel drive or then here all wheel drive with a rear wheel bias. Wheels 17 to 19 inch and here the M240i directly comes with the 19 inch wheels. And in this technology pack, you even have, you know, some more fancy stuff. These are then even wider tires and that's why they also get these additional flaps here at the side and the M performance or the M colors badge right there. We have contrasting mirror caps here as well and Sunder Night Metallic is the name of this very special purple color. The door handles are now integrated but also lift up like this. Hey, door closing sound. It's not too bad for a vehicle that has frameless doors actually. Yeah, and then we have you know, these shoulder or haunches area in a very, very strong way. So yeah, no doubt about that sporty styling. Wow, then there's something very special coming ahead right here. Look at this, the tail lamps, super three-dimensional. Wow, this is really something very unique and a daring design overall at the rear, very strong here, although we are in the compact segment. X-Drive, that means it's the all-way drive model and then the super strong diffuser style here as well. And out of the fake exhaust police is right here because these Freiform blenden, listen and repeat. 
Freiform blenden. <lacht> That's the German word for like a freeform outline cover, so to speak, for the exhaust tips. The rear ones then are there on the inside. The weight balance, by the way, 50-50, so very well balanced between front and rear axle. And of course, this model here, it's worthwhile to take a look at that engine. Ta-da! The three-liter inline six-cylinder by BMW, one of the most popular combustion engines nowadays, performance engines, and performance batch there too. So, 374 horsepower. 4.3 seconds is the acceleration figure, and in this case, then the rear wheel biased all wheel drive. However, it is already confirmed that here the 240i will also come as a rear wheel drive only version. So, the combination 6 cylinder plus rear wheel drive will be possible, just not the manual gearbox. You can also get a 230i, that then would be the 2 liter 4 cylinder with 245 horsepower and 5.5 seconds in the acceleration figure. This is then the entry level version for the US. And there's also a 220i, even less horsepower, 2, uh, two, two liter 4 cylinder. <laughs> and there will also be, even for European market, a 2 liter 4 cylinder diesel. This year, however, even has a 30% share in the whole sales. So this is also one of the major engine models for this generation. And about suspensions, the base 2 Series Coupe would already start with progressive dampers. And then when you go for the 240i model, you get a fixed sport suspension, unless what we also have here today, you go for this adaptive M suspension, which is then the balance between sportiness and comfort. Does it work? We will find out in the driving part very soon. And here we have another color choice for you. Interesting color here called Brooklyn Gray. And yeah, really some, you know, urban rebel maybe. <laughs> so also with the 19 inch wheels and the accentuations here around the wheel arches because these are also the performance tires in this technology pack. So what do you think? Will this one be rather your choice or the purple color with our main vehicle today? And if you want to top up the sporty styling even more, from the M Performance Parts bin. You can take here carbon fiber situations around the kidney, also in the lower spoiler part, side spoiler even more enhanced, and then even up to 20 inch wheels. We have them also mounted right here, special M valve caps and the side spoiler as well, M Performance stickers here, and then especially here in the rear part, this additional element right here, even more carbon fiber. This is maybe a little bit too extreme, or is it? Carbon fiber lip here in the rear part, would it be too much for you? Tell me in the comments and also a carbon fiber diffuser then in the lower style. Trunk with a manual opening, but yeah, it's no problem at all. You can see 390 liters is the capacity and the cabin trolley also fits in vertically. A little bit less than a meter or 40 inches in width and the length here is about 90 centimeters or 35 inches and the height, last but not least here, 50 centimeters or yeah, some 20 inches. And the reason for that is they don't have anything to fold up. They really lowered the floor as low as possible. And overall, you know, considering that is a compact sports vehicle, still some flexibility. Talking about that, you can also fold the seats, release them here and here. And then we can also push through. And just the thing is, you know, this happens when my driver's seat is in my position. On the right side, then I push the seat forward. So you can only fold these seats then when the seats are also moved forward a little bit more. But can you still drive this at all adult? Mm, doubtful. This is the key, then in this case with the M colors at the side. Then once again, close up of these door handles. This is actually quite good feedback they give. And then inside of the doors is actually more or less hard pack. Wow. I mean, it has an interesting structure right here, but really BMW? Hmm. Then soft touch here, but also, yeah, not that soft. Interesting graphic here. This is also backlit, by the way, so some joyful things. Then you have the M entry badge and the 240i model we have here, and also the M steering wheel. Still with real buttons at the steering wheel, left and right, so that's good to have. Sumo to instruments and infotainment this is the optional. Thing, the bigger ones you can get here. As for the seats, these are the optional M Sport seats with animal skin. You cannot get them in the US actually. However, they do offer a wide variety of non animal seating. So, in Europe, for example, you would start with fabric on the inside or then Alcantara, 
microfiber here for the M240i model and outside center tackle leatherette, high grade leatherette and you can also get three colors of perforated new sensor tech seats and they are also available in the US. A basic sport seat is always standard here for the new 2 series model. So um, yeah, overall good choice you have but we can't show them to you today sadly. Here then steering wheel in and out, very smooth process, actually one of the smoothest processes there is in the industry and you already feel it, well these M sports here are really stiff and this seating position here already tells you like Let's race. <laughs> Interior overview, quite clean, but this one here, once again, hard pack. Did I do that? <laughs> or maybe with the uh, gesture control? I don't know. Strange. Hmm, mystery. Then we can see here, there's a nice framing here with Hofmeister King design. Climate unit, gladly still manual. You can also control it very well while driving. For RPMs would be on the right side. It depends really on the mode you have here in the sport mode. Then we also have the RPM visualization. Umbrum. Shifting pedals here. Interesting that while driving you press and hold the left pedal. You get in this M sports or race downshift mode. Already you know then goes back a couple of gears and then you can really hammer it through. Right here in the middle console, still a manual volume knob. Then you can open this one here for inductive charging pad for your phone. And you have then the wireless Apple CarPlay connection. And here, adaptive cup holders. This one is the shifting lever. Pull it backwards or forwards for the reverse mode. And to the left side would be the manuelle Schaltgasse. Listen and repeat, manuelle Schaltgasse, like manual shifting way. <laughs> then you have the Sport mode, comfort mode, and so on. Great to also have the you know, classic MMI knob, although it's not called MMI knob at BMW or iDrive selector. So this is also very practical to do it while driving. And here the classic armrest, very well attached, space and USB-C charger. Very cool feature here when you have the M240i, you get these knee pads, so a softer leatherette area right there where your knees uh, you know, hit the middle console while racy driving is a very good idea. And my favorite interior feature at home, it never does go away. Here the BMW Wings style light. I sense time code comments, Thomas in the rear seat. <laughs> and here, when we fold the seat like this, it automatically slides forward. But the thing is, yeah, with one when it's 86 or six with one. Um, this way it works, headroom wise, it's all very close. But then legroom wise, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's coming up. Ah, which, uh, ah. <laughs> okay, it gets squished, then the seat goes forward again. And by this, I, yeah. I mean, if the passenger would be a little bit smaller, then it could work. So two and a half adults, but four adults, no way, because when you look here behind my driver's seat, I could never actually fit in there. So uh, yeah, definitely more like a two plus two seat or something. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Welcome to Thomas's Performance Driving Lounge. 0 to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour here with the BMW 240i. Wow, really impressive and super calm and collected. Great acceleration, but still had so much traction. Wow, and here, if you go there, you some slalom style. Indeed, you feel this, you know, inclination. There's a so direct command of the, of the wheels in the front. It feels so sporty, light and compact indeed. And yeah, this inline six cylinder, you know, yeah, there are electric vehicles out there, but if you go combustion engine, this one is, yeah, one of the perfect engines out there. It's so much fun, actually. For the launch control, by the way, I had to go to the sports traction mode and also to the manual Schaltgasse, the manual, you know, shifting um, corridor, we can also say. Um, here, of course, this was, you know, like, rather control environment and please don't repeat this and we just do this for you know a 
that you can get a very good sport impression of the vehicle and they usually don't do this in normal everyday driving life. So now I have put all the DSC on again and we're still in the Sport Plus mode. So this brings already a lot of sportiness, but no, we don't have to deactivate the traction control for that. And I'm also in a normal shifting mode. or It's, it's a still a sporty shifting mode because we're here in that Sport Plus mode. And the car already tells me, you know, like, let's, let's attack, let's go. So let's here go to the motorway. So, getting on between the trucks. Yeah, let's go to the sports shifting mode once again. This is also pretty cool. And we can also show that to you now this new um, functionality. When I'm holding the left pedal now, let's see. There we go. Wow, really cool. It also sets a sprint mode, and then you can also shift up yourself. So it also works, by the way, when in a normal mode, for example, comfort mode, then we're usually in a very, very high gear. Then the difference is even bigger. So if I, for example, now comfort mode, high gear for you know, better fuel efficiency and so on. And when you then hold the left, press and hold the left pedal, sprint mode, then directly hop back a couple of gears and we can accelerate it out. And here, now top speed. Let's see, not for this vehicle top speed, but here we step at 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. Wow, it's really cool, so stable and relatively calm on the road also. Not too much wind noise and it feels like, it feels like nothing for the vehicle. So we're at this really high speed, of course it can go even faster, but it's so calm and collected, it doesn't feel small or compact or something, it feels like a grown-up sports car indeed. Yeah, there's a longer wheelbase now and you really feel that. And indeed, more feels like a 3 Series. So you definitely feel this, um, you know, the resemblance here from the, from the compact platform, from, sorry, from the mid-size platform it is. So a compact vehicle here, but mid-size platform. And wow, so much stability here on the motorway. This is really awesome. So I, I didn't expect it to be that calm collected here at the same time it is sporty and aggressive if you really like and i mean I, I feel like i could easily go double the speed without any problem at all then there are also modern assistance systems for example you have the cruise control right here keeping distance to the car in front of us here for example i'm not braking the car is doing that for us this one is also then here, change in the distance, right here at the steering wheel. But you know, you can also keep it more, more basic with that. You don't have to, um, you know, go for the most elaborate assistance systems. So maybe the lane keeping assist is not the most important feature here for this vehicle. It feels very, very, you know, grounded here, so to speak, on the motorway. It's a very, very good motorway vehicle. And if you compare it, for example, to the Audi RS3, they are both very aggressive, but both so, so highly evolved and both have in common that with the adaptive suspension, we also have the adaptive suspension here, they really present this compromise, you know. In the comfort mode, the suspension is really comfortable, also for the passengers. In the sports mode, then, we have a little bit more feedback from its suspension and you just get more sportiness. And at the same time, Although we have the sports performance wheels here with 19 inch also, it's still okay, you know? So we have some sports vehicles which are then very uncomfortable or something, but here that's actually totally fine. Yes, the M sport seats here, they have less comfort than, than the normal sport seats, but the good thing is you, you can't get them in all markets anyway, and I guess that's actually a good thing, especially when you have them the perforated sense tag or even the fabric or microfiber surface in, in your EU, then you will have even more comfort with these. Here, yeah, you know, 145 kilometers an hour, 90 miles an hour, still very good as for the noise insulation and so on. So the whole car has some really very good build quality. It feels indeed like a perfect driving machine. Would I go for the RS3 or here for the 2 Series as the M240i? Yeah, it's a really tough call. They feel quite different in the end result. Um, 
are of course playing with the same segment, yes, but hmm, here you have, you know, the true rear wheel all-wheel drive, you know. In the RS3 you have this torque split, which also feels pretty cool, but here the main difference is this car still tells you, even in the all-wheel drive version here, I'm rear-wheel drive, period. And this is something that just comes more natural in the sports car driving field. The RS3 is also a perfect driving machine, but due to this more, let's say, basic character of this one here, yeah, it still conveys more, more natural purist driving feeling. Uh, that sound is really something, isn't it? Some countryside driving and also with some fork here. And the only thing that really buggers me is the steering feeling, you know. It is sporty, yes, and you know there's not a dead zone area or something, but just my claim has been now for a couple of years since the introduction of the only BMW 3 Series generation, it should be the benchmark for BMW steering feel, but it is not. The SUVs have a better steering feel. This one here, it feels too much arcade, not natural enough, like through thin air, even in the sports mode, it doesn't give you too much, you know, not, not enough feedback actually. So you can drive this one very well in a very sporty way and also very precise and directly. That's really great. But then again, hmm, they just need a more natural steering feel and Somehow, it just doesn't seem to work here in this generation of the BMW 3 Series and also then the derivatives like here, the 2 Series Coupe. Yeah, I mean, it's still a lot of fun. Oh, by the way, have you heard it when you... Yeah, no, not. When you let off the throttle. There we go. Not sure if you can pick up on the camera, like blah, 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 from the sports exhaust. It's really nice. That's, you know, what you also want when you get this, this vehicle here. Yeah, but then again, they really have to work on the steering feel. It might be, you know, arguing on a very high level or something. But there, for example, the Audi RS3 has a way better natural steering feeling. Still, this one here, yeah, it has so much, so much character, you know. And the, um, besides the steering, you know, how you feel connected to the vehicle, you know, with your whole body or something, this is really very excellent here. So you kind of have this feeling that you are connected with your whole body to the chassis. That's something they really achieved here very well. They've also strengthened the um, chassis rigidity if you compare it to the predecessor and you all, you know, you really feel it and also from the wider track and the lengthened wheelbase and so on, negative camber inclination. So all these measures here really account for a true sports car, so much fun to me even most astonishing was that you can drive it in a very comfortable way on the motorway and I mean at any time 50 to 100 or something this goes so quickly Blop, that's it wow and you know when you don't drive it like this all the time but rather in a more subtle way you can also score some consumption figures like 8 liters or more kilometers so 30 mpg something yeah when you let it run on the motorway, for example. So really impressive here today. Good that they uh, still have the rear wheel platform, either than pure rear wheel drive or here then with that all wheel drive, but glad to say that most of the time it will be rear wheel, by, rear wheel only. If you really hammer a throttle, then you also have the front support, definitely rear wheel bias remains. So even if you have the all wheel drive here, you do not have to be afraid of losing that rear wheel bias still so much fun. Welcome to Our Tiger Fool. I'm Brian. Today, a very special behind the scenes look at the brand new BMW M2. Well, we've been waiting a long time for this. This is BMW's most scrappy street fighter. And if you're wondering exactly what that means, this is their most tracked car of every car they produce. They tell me that one in five of these that they sell ends up on a track. So clearly this is not all about appearance. This car has to perform well as well. Now, long time viewers will know exactly how I feel about this car. So I'm more than a little bit excited. And as is always the case, I'm a bit nervous about what they do when they tell you it's a complete redesign. 
the first impression is going to be important in this car. And the two words that really hit me about what they've done with the front end of this thing are Tron and Transformers. This is really blocky 80s graphic style. This is maybe the last one of these street visors they'll be able to produce because of course everything goes electric. Here we're cramming in an inline six cylinder engine, still absolutely beautiful internal combustion engine technology. This is really all about the driving experience and clearly the aesthetic needs to mirror that. So for me, there's a huge amount of callback here in the front about those 80s muscle cars, but in a very modern way. I love these huge square air intakes. It's so aggressive, but so low to the ground. It gives such a powerful appearance. Now in other two series models, you may know that you have adaptive air intakes across the front. Ah, they've done away with that nonsense for the M2. They simply don't need it. There is so much air being driven through this engine by these enhanced air intakes. There's no need of any adaptability whatsoever. The assumption with the design of this car is you're already gonna be driving this at the maximum speed you're legally allowed to when you're off track and really pushing it when you're on. So the most airflow they can get through to that engine, the happier they are. Now look at the way that design language comes up through here. You'll be familiar with this new BMW light signature that comes into the front headlights, but the way it works in contrast with this black front on the front of the new M2 is particularly dynamic. Slightly higher up as you come up the visual line of the car, the most impressive thing that strikes you is the contrast from this new carbon roof right through down into the bonnet. Now, the reason that that's taken place is apparently there were two main complaints that standard M2 customers had with the last issue. The first was the door mirrors. Well, we'll take a look at those when we get round the side. And the second was no carbon roof option available. So the carbon roof is not a cheap option. That's gonna add at least 3,000 to your cost of car. But look at the way that contrast works from the top to the front. I started off by saying, this may very well be the last such car you're gonna be able to buy so it just might be worth it. Four meters 57 or 180 inches. The wheelbase on the new M2 is actually 5.4 centimeters longer than the predecessor, that's about this, and that's part of what helps to give this car such an aggressive stance. Not only that, I don't know if the keen eyed amongst you have spotted, but the front wheels are actually one inch smaller than the rear wheels. So 19 inches on the front and 20 on the rear. Now, a lot of that is to do with the fact that any M2 fan's gonna be able to tell you, it's gotta be rear wheel drive, right? So that's the only way you can get this car, rear wheel drive. Now, BMW have this big thing about 50-50 weight distribution. Well, they say 50-50. This one's actually 48 in the rear and 52 in the front. That, of course, is the engine. So you're still gonna have a little bit of a bias, but what you do get is a really refined, precise position on the road. And I'm hoping that that is even more pronounced in this longer wheelbase car than it was in the predecessor, which by the way, was an excellent drive. Now, I think it was a really good feature to make sure that this time the M series rear view mirrors were included right from the get go. That's such an important signature feature of the entire way that the side of this car presents. Nice to see it. Now, you'll be aware with the styling details on other cars within the two series, that there's a lot more carbon effect, a lot more detail. That's very showy. It's nice for customers to have that choice, but I like that they've resisted that temptation here. If you look, for example, low down at this door sill as it runs the length, it's uncomplicated, unfussy, and everything about the side presentation of this car just says, I'm here for business, which is what I like. Now these larger wheels that are one inch larger both in front and rear than they are on the standard two series come at a cost of a slight addition of weight. So as you can imagine, when you factor that in and the increased size of the engine, you're gonna be looking at a slightly higher weight number. So they have worked right throughout the car at reducing that rate elsewhere. So if you do go with the carbon roof, for example, and in a little minute, we're gonna take a look at those carbon seats that are optional extras, you can help bring that weight right down. So the total curbside weight of this car, 1,700 kilograms. I don't think that they've wasted any of that where it doesn't need to be used. 
What do you think? This color, in case you're wondering, is Toronto Red, and you might recognize this from existing M3 and M4 models. I think it particularly works for the M2 because, again, of that dynamic contrast between the black and the nice matte red finish. So that's what I like. I don't know about the rear of this car. Now, what BMW have said is that this spoiler across the back is essential for aerodynamic performance. I'm sure it helps, but if you visually remove this aesthetic, you can see how the bottom looks a little bit thin here, especially with such a huge, bold statement right at the base of the car. Now that clearly has been done to make this look extremely aggressive, and who can't fail to be a fan of these massive M-style exhaust pipes in the back of this diffuser at the rear? Well, again, that's all for aerodynamic performance, but to me, it leaves a little bit of a contrast which hasn't quite been resolved. Massive, dynamic, bold statement at the bottom, a little bit lacking visually at the top. That said, these rear lights really do help with that dynamic by pulling the focus away from what I think is a slightly weaker top section. So whether or not you think that it's necessary for your aerodynamics to have these statements, it certainly does lend itself to a very distinctive rear. Now, I'll tell you what I'm interested in. This, to me, really is evocative of earlier generations of Alfa Romeo. Am I crazy there, or do you get that feeling as well? Let's take a look and see what's powering this thing. Hmm. What you're looking at is a three-liter, six-cylinder inline engine producing 460 horsepower or 550 newton meters of torque. Paired with this engine, you can either go with a manual or automatic gearbox. That's an eight-speed Steptronic automatic gearbox, which is going to propel you from zero to 100 in 4.1 seconds, or the manual, which is going to take 4.3. Come on, you don't want an automatic gearbox with this car, surely. Here you can see the key. It's a pretty light affair. You've always got to make the choice as to whether you want these things to be really solid feeling and heavy in your pocket, or light and easy to carry around. I think I'm gonna go with the light because at the end of the day, it does have to sit in my pocket. Now, the door handle, as soon as you touch it, does feel a little bit on the plastic side, but as you pull it up, it's got a nice solid reassuring feel to it. And given that these doors are frameless, again, they have a nice solid feel to them and the noise that they make is quite rewarding. As you open the car up, the very first thing that strikes you, of course, is these big bucket seats. Now, they're carbon fiber and they're only available in a leather finish. The designers tell us that's because they simply can't get the same effect of the heating and cooling using synthetic materials. Honestly, I don't know if I believe that. There are many other options available right now, but if you want these bucket seats, they're gonna run you between three and 4,000 extra on top of your list, and you're not gonna be able to get them in any other finish. I don't know. I've never found bucket seats to be the most comfortable thing in the world. The defining feature is, are you taking this car on the track or not? Well. 20% of people who buy this car will be tracking it. And if you're one of those guys, I think to get the best out of the driving experience, you are looking at these seats. For everyone else, if you're not taking this on the track, really, the sensor tech finish is great. Check it out before you make a decision. Now, I already said big on 80 styling, take a look in this door. What you can see here is a pixelated backlit color finish. Again, it just reinforces the 80s styling of the design of this vehicle. For me, that's no bad thing. I sort of wonder if the designers at BMW are as carried away with stranger things as the rest of the planet is right now. I don't know. For me, it's an evocative callback to the muscle cars of old that had literally no safety features whatsoever. So nice contrast between the modern, that being all the new tech, and the real power era, that being the car itself. Does all of that tie into a comfortable experience? Because anyone who's ever sat in a Lamborghini Countach will tell you, it may have looked fantastic on the road, but driving it was no laughing matter. Well, things have moved on a little bit since then. So these bucket, bucket seats are actually pretty comfortable. I am five feet 10 or 178 centimeters in height. I have a long torso though, and as you can see, I have acres of room in the head. Now, a lot of that is going to be this carbon fiber roof taking up a lot less space up here. The car feels very powerful from this sitting position. Let me see if I can adjust the seat. 
Now, that very nicely illustrates gripe number one. If I'm in a car that is purely designed for performance, I really don't need everything to be electric. One, it takes so much longer than just having the manual catch points. But two, it's adding extra weight that I don't want in the car. So this is an interesting compromise of design in a performance vehicle. Is it necessary? To me, not so much, but I guess their feedback must tell them the customers like it, otherwise why would you fit it to the car? When you're making your seat selection for this car, it is worth considering the carbon footprint. I feel a bit silly saying that about a performance car, but still, 85% less is how much you will achieve if you go with a synthetic fabric for your finish and not with leather. I think that's worth considering. If you want to see the details on that, you can get them through BMW's website. If there's one thing bothering me about the initial presentation, it's this. And this is the thing that BMW are most proud of of the interior. This is a 12.3 inch driver display and a 14.9 inch infotainment system display. Why does it bother me? Well, I guess the first thing would be the new BMW ID8 operating system. The positive is that it is very fast and responsive compared with earlier. The second is, my goodness, just look at all of this. I think it's gonna take more than a little bit of time for you to figure out how on earth to navigate around all of this. I like giving people options, that's great. But this is a full blown laptop baked into my car. And this is where I have the challenge. What I love about this car is the immediacy of its performance. Now that's demonstrated here with this gearbox. This is a manual six speed gearbox and the designers tell me they had to fight to keep this in the car. Why? Well, because obviously the automatic is not only more efficient, but it's also faster. You can't drive this any quicker than the automatic gearbox will already carry you. But that doesn't speak to the emotion of this car. And that I think is the problem I have with the new technology and the way that it's been baked in. I would suggest that the vast majority of people who buy this car couldn't care less about this. This is the first time that the M2 has only come with adaptive suspension, for example. Three different settings. Previously, it was just standard suspension. Now that clearly made it a somewhat less comfortable, more challenging drive, but that was the point. So am I just being a whingy old man? I guess this is my position. If this is the last one of these I'm going to be able to buy, because in future everything's electric, and then sure, I'll expect all of this. Was it too much to ask that for the last one I couldn't have those big meaty analog dials that I and so many other people love so much? Ah, maybe I'm just a dinosaur. I'm sure all of this tech works brilliantly and gives you so many more everyday usage features that are helpful while you're driving around in this car. But you know what? Nobody ever fitted a carbon fiber bucket seat into a car that was there for doing a supermarket trip. You know what I mean? Really, this car is all about the drive. And I won't find out exactly how much this affects me until I have the chance to take this out on a track. And thank you BMW for paying some attention to that at least. It's the first one with an available head up display, but brilliantly, you can switch this off when you're in track mode. So that's great. Now I don't want to challenge this too much. I'm sure that new adaptive suspension is going to drive great. I'm sure it's going to make me feel more comfortable and more secure in the car. It's bigger, it's more powerful, it's got a wider stance. It's even got an increased camber on the wheels to give it more road holding. This car is going to be a beast. I just don't want it to be too easy to drive. What always set me on fire about the M2, in particular the M2 competition, was that feeling that there was just a little edge that was a little ragged. That's what I love about that car. So I'm desperately hoping with all this new digital refinement and all these new options, that hasn't got lost in the mix. What gives me hope? This does, the manual gearbox. Thank you BMW for preserving this. Well, we can't really see what the displays offer without our first opportunity to hear what the car sounds like by starting it. So let's see in the cabin what that inline six cylinder sounds like. That's nice. Oh, bad owner, service overdue. And we can change the display mode. 
Let's change it to track and see what that does. Okay, if Michelle pans back to the driver's display, you can see that gives us less clutter on the screen. And we also have the opportunity, I think, to configure our road system so we can put in all kinds of different information and make it available to us to display exactly where we want, exactly what we want to see. Interesting to note, in deference to the older guys like me, there's still a manual volume knob for your infotainment system, but unsurprisingly, no manual climate controls. Those are all through the screen here. And as you might be able to tell, they are very definitely not the most intuitive things to use in the world, but there are some buttons to access some of the central features down here. This button on the right-hand side is for fans on off. It's not on right now. The climate controls are switched off but they do feel more than a little plasticky when you push them and they do not separate themselves in an obvious enough way to make it super easy to pick them and control them when you're having fun cornering at speed. Carbon fiber and light detailing continue right throughout the cockpit and really helped again to extend that sort of sports slash 80s vibe that you get from the rest of the car. In the central cockpit here, you know, this is an interesting feature. I've never liked the way that these BMW gearboxes look, but it's only when you actually start using them that you lose all interest in concerning yourself with that. It's such a nicely put together piece of equipment. Center console here is very unfussy. I like that they've hidden the storage away where you don't need to look at it all the time. Cup holders, that perennial love-hate thing in all cars has been kept well out of the way so you can pretend to your passenger that they don't exist at all. USB charge point, but also inductive charging for a phone down here, and a nice feature of an additional 12 volt charge point for anything else. All can be kept well out of the way, hidden underneath that useful flap. Back here, further standard BMW controls for the infotainment system, if you prefer accessing them in that way. Decent bit of storage in the middle, a nice, inductive charging pad for a mobile phone there. More charge points, really happy to see that they've put more than enough of those in. There are two nice features you get with a bucket seat. The first is the weight loss and the second, ah, mostly I don't have to have that irritating weight for the electrics to catch up with the fact that I want to sit in the rear. Well, you may well say, who on earth is ever sitting in the rear of this car? I'll tell you who, somebody with extremely short legs, but a long torso. Let's find out if it's doable. Well, you may have seen Thomas do this in his review. He's just too big. We need to do something to make his legs a little shorter. Look at this. I have palatial space back here. Okay, that's a bit of an overstatement. But you know what? There actually is plenty of room. Yes, I have very short legs. Yes, this driver's seat is set for me. But I do have a long torso. And although I'm pretty compact back here, I have enough space to make myself comfortable. So who cares? The long and the short of it is, if you want to put kids back here, there's ample room. And if you want to fit normal sized people back here for a short trip, they're going to be plenty comfortable. Thomas is a tall guy. So, okay, I get you wouldn't want to fit a six foot three person in the rear of one of these cars, but for a normal human being, sorry to offend tall people out there, it's more than comfortable. This car has the optional leather in the back. You don't need that. You can get the Alcantara and the Sensatec. I think it actually might be more comfortable. This is a very dynamic driving car. And needless to say, if you're in the front, those bucket seats are not going to tell you what's happening to your passengers in the rear who are going to roll around in these seats because there really is no position holding at all. So rear seats, very much an afterthought. Who cares? If anyone's sitting back here, the only thing they should be thinking is, Maybe I need to work a bit harder so I can be sitting in the front of this car instead of in the back. Back on those rear seat passengers again. If you're asking yourself, can I really get away with convincing my partner that our two brand new precious bundles of joy are safe in the back of this thing? Don't worry, there is Isofix. So if that's your reason for worrying about whether you're gonna be allowed to buy one of these things, carry on. We're gonna take a look in the back and Thomas has given me my very own measuring stick so I can show you what's going on back there. Well, I don't know how bothered a standard customer is going to be about what they can fit in the back of one of these while they're racing around the track, but that is 390 litres of load space you're looking at, which I think is hugely impressive for this car. Now, to give you a sense of scale, if you have a look at this, it's a standard carry-on flight case. 
So you have more than enough room in depth. That's 37 inches or 95 centimeters. Well, give or take 90 centimeters, I think is a bit more accurate. And for the width, you're looking at 98 centimeters or almost a meter. Thomas, I know you're gonna to be tutting while you're looking at this like, Brian, this is not how you use the stick. I'll get better guys, it's my first time. Okay, and then for inches, for width, around about 38 to 40. So plenty of load space, but we're not all done there. If I pull this catch down here, you can see that the seats, well, in an ideal world, they just drop down, but I'll give it a little bit of encouragement from the inside. And there you can see the extra load space. So if you watch Thomas's review of the 240i, you will see that he thinks you can't fold the seats down fully. Again, he's got really long legs and that's why they won't fold down. If you have reasonable person-sized legs, no problem at all. Come on, Thomas find something to do about that. In our full review of the all new generation of the BMW Z4 Roadster, I want to start to take you on a small journey. It is a journey throughout the most recent history of BMW Roadsters, starting with the Z1, built from 89 until 91, so just shortly with those sliding up side doors, very interesting. Then the first Z3, 95 until 2002. And the car always grew a little bit in length. This is the first Z4 generation from 2002 until 2008. And the second Z4 generation from 2009 until 2016. So the recent one that is now having the successor. And there was also the Z8. Just 5,700 pieces were hand built actually. And I want you guys to guess in which period of time this one here was built if you look at the other models here. So look again here at the Z8. Tell me in the comments without googling it. In which period of time was the Z8 built of those other four cars? And later on I'll solve the riddle. And don't google it yet. Keep watching. But now let's focus on the all new vehicle. Then in the front you can see you have a way wider front double kidney with BMW here. This is the M40i. So you have those matte gray accentuations. The base model would come with chrome double kidney frame. And you can also get a dark package where you have a shiny black double kidney frame. So you have some possibilities there. The M40i also has bigger air intakes in the lower part, stronger lower bumper. And those tail, uh, those headlamps, they start with LED and optional, the ones we see here, the adaptive LED lights. 4 meter 32 or 14 foot 1 is the total length of the only generation of the Z4. That's 9 centimeters longer than the previous generation. So again, an increase in length has been the theme also throughout the evolution of the Roadster models. 17 inch rims it starts, 18 inch for the M40i which we see today here, 19 inch those ones we see, those ones are optional. The M40i also with the air outtake here and a contrasting way, contrasting mirror caps. This color is called frozen gray, it is a matte paint you can also here, how I feel it, basically. Very interesting. I really like those, uh, those matte gray paints. And the design is rising towards the end of the vehicle. And this new generation, you can see, is a little bit longer right there at the rear end. And that makes it, let's say, more grown up. This roof, by the way, is gray. And it has this ice cream parlor function that you can also open and close it. Not only from the inside, but also from the outside when you hold the closing button of the key. The roof is available in grey, as you can see here, also fitting to the exterior colour, but also in black, classic black convertible roof. And you can also then open and close the windows just with keeping on the opening or closing button. So we can open it once more again. If you want to open it while driving, that's possible up to a speed of 50 kilometers an hour. And it takes about 10 seconds if you haven't checked it out in the time code so far. 
The rear end is where the car really changed its design. You have those more horizontally drawn tail lamps. That's pretty common now in the automotive industry to do it that way to give a visual width for the vehicle. And this integrated wing, I think it's a good solution instead of adding a separate one. Here the M40i, by the way, comes with massive exhaust pipes and they look fake at first sight, but they're indeed real because they indeed dissolve from the round pipe into this wide angular end pipe. And on the other side, by the way, not the one that is close to me now, so on the right side than there of the vehicle, there you can also see an exhaust valve inside for even better sound. The M40i, by the way, not only comes with bigger brakes, but also with a rear differential lock and also with a lower adaptive sports suspension. There's also base suspension available, but you can also go for the adaptive sports suspension, which sits a little bit lower for the normal models. With the M40i, it automatically comes then. And interesting also that the weight balance, they could bring it here to 50-50 front axle, rear axle. That should promise us a very sporty ride. Looking forward to that very soon. What do you think? Does it look better with the open top or here with the closed top? I think they managed really to have a good design line when you close the top so that you have something like a coupe with a soft top when it's closed. So this is also one step forward with those new convertible roofs. They're also quite durable by the way, so it's not necessary to have a hard top. You know, the Z4 also has a hard top history. So I think it's a good step that they went for the soft top here. Again, it's lighter, you have more capacity than in the trunk. And it's still quite durable and looks cool and still forms this coupe style silhouette, although it's a roadster. Or what do you think? So with the top model, the M40i, we got the 3 liter R6 engine, so 6 cylinder petrol engine, here with 340 horsepower, 4.5 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, so pretty good performance for sure. And then you're also able to get smaller ones. The 20i 2-liter 4-cylinder with 197 horsepower or the 30i 2-liter 4-cylinder with 258 horsepower. So before we take a look at the all-new interior here, also the small evolution of the interior of BMW Roadsters. When it started with the Z1, you can see nowadays you would say this looks super cheap, but at that time it was really very modern and up-to-date. The Z3 also very puristic and again this is the pure roadster choice still. AJ recently also took a spin exactly in this very vehicle there. Then the first generation Z4. This is also what you consider as yeah that already looks like a modern car. At that stage more the infotainment systems were evolving getting new screens and stuff. You can already see that at the second generation of the Z4 where the infotainment system is more prominent for sure as you would expect it today. And then especially the Z8 where we also solve our today's ridicule. Take a look at that, this retro style which is still somehow timeless. Incredible interior for sure. I think so at least. What do you think? And this was built, the Z8, between 2000 and 2003. And what does that mean? Well, it was the closing stage of the first generation of the Z4. And if you then compare those, maybe scroll back again, you can see that the Z8 interior looks way more modern than the time uh, you know, it was built. And also if you compare the vehicles at that time where it was built. So that's the car key, nothing new there. We already know this one. The M40i also gets the M colors at the side of the key. Also with the keyless entry. And let's open those doors. You can see right here the Hofmeister knick at the door handles, this famous BMW design language. Then the sides are covered with leatherette, also really well tightly wrapped. Soft materials also for the armrest. Seems like a good build quality. You cannot really fit anything properly at the inside of the doors. That's of course a downside. The M40i has this entry cap right there. Then M Sport steering wheel. This is also then new. Those new buttons here, left side for the cruise control, is optional. The AEB, autonomous emergency brake, is standard equipment. Cruise control with the adaptive one, ACC, optional. Right side, for example, for voice control. And this steering can even be heated. You can already see the screens 
10.25 inch on both sides, left and right. Soon more deals to that. First of all, let's talk about the seats here from the side perspective of the interior. There are two seat forms available. This one is the optional performance seat that comes with the M40i or optional for the other cars. But also the base sports seats have already integrated head restraint. They don't look so different, so not too much of a difference. This one here has more electric function, functions, for example, here for the side bolsters, but they won't be too different, actually. And as surfaces, this is the optional animal skin equipment, which you don't really need. The performance seat usually comes with Alcatara on the inside, and BMW says real leather on the outside, they say at least. Well, on the inside, Alcantara is of course a better choice then also to stick a little bit more to the seat for the side support. That's better when racing. And you do not, do not stick to the seat as for the heat because with Alcantara you stay cooler in summer and warmer in winter than with this one. Also in the US, there will be a full sensor tech option available that you get a more sustainable leather red choice but that's only in the US and only with the standard seat not here with the adaptive sport seat it's a little bit complicated as always those trims but you know maybe rewind this part if you're really interested in buying one then you know exactly then what to buy so I would go with the base seat with the sensor tech in the US or if you only have the possibility with this one for example with the M40i or are in the non-US markets, then go with this adaptive sport seat with the Alcantara on the inside. That would be my two tips. Well, I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1 if you haven't subscribed so far and I have the seat at the moment in the lowest position. Indeed, you sit very low in the roadster. That's, you know, what's supposed to be. By the way, early I tested also all seating positions in Z1, Z3, Z41, Z42 and here Z43 and also in the Z8. And the Z3 was really completely different. You uh, more more like a MX-5 Mazda today, where you sit more on the car, have this true roadster feeling. Those Z4 roadsters, they don't have exactly the 100% true roadster feeling. It's more a compromise between roadster and comfort for sure. Which is again considering the bias of this vehicle, maybe also not a bad decision. You just have to bear that in mind. So that means you know all the console here the middle console is really high in comparison to where you're seating and a real true play road so like the z3 or the master mx5 i would more expect to sit a little bit more on the car to have like a smaller go-cut but you know also those cars here they tend to be, go longer and longer and longer but interesting is still that i have quite a comfortable seating position i can watch those digital instruments there's also the new head-up display soon also detail to that that is an option then Digital instruments always come like those. And important, of course, I mean, now I have, you know, some free air. And you can see that the front dashboard here, the front windscreen, sorry, goes way over my head. But interesting, of course, what about when I close the roof? Because then actually, so I turn on the ignition for that, or maybe the engine. <laughs> so... What about that roof? Yeah, there it comes. What about the headroom when the roof is closed? That's of course very interesting. And this seems here, although the car looks super flat, seems to be abundance of headroom here. So even for tall people, no problem in this roadster. And there's this again, an advantage of the very low seating position and this non so super true roadster style that you can even get along with taller people here in that vehicle. And by the way, the steering wheel here has a manual control for reach and height and works in a very smooth way, so you can also do that just with one hand. Interior overview, very interesting because they use good materials. They did have to work on their interiors and gladly BMW did. A structured surface with a soft touch, really like that. Then a still classic manual climate unit with a display right there but you can still click it while driving. I need to have this pure roadster stuff and infotainment unit with touch screen, but you can also use this turning and pressing knob, the classic one still. The steering wheel a little bit asymmetrical, as we know from the M steering wheels, pretty thick also. Clear view to the digital instruments, soon looking forward how that works on, out with a head-up display. And also metal knurled 
volume knobs. I like that, that they paid attention to details right there. Those are some hotkeys, by the way, you can freely program them. And when you take a look at the lower area right there, we have the gear shifter, automatic gearbox, 8-speed, we have some USB power supply right there, but also inductive charging possibilities for your phone. You can also close it. Ah, here it is. Just like this, manual front and, and rear. Nowadays, yeah, you come with those automatic functions, but I mean, why not? That's a simple solution. In the lower middle console with those driving modes, makes sense with the adaptive suspension then, of course. Here, well, from the inside, you can control the roof. And again, also metal knurling for the turning and pressing knob. And indeed, I'm really satisfied now with the build quality. The middle arm rest, you can slide them open and another spot to store your smartphone, for example, and a USB-C port as well as adaptive cup holders. And about the storage areas, well, they are indeed limited. Here you have some room, even a top tether, by the way, for a child seat here behind the co-driver seat. And you can also reach through, through the trunk from here. This is a ski hatch, basically. Won't be too long enough for skiers, I think, but you can at least, you know, put some longer things than if you also open it at the other side. Or for cats. Or for cats, yeah, of course. Why for cats? <laughs> I mean, yeah, cats do fit in there, yeah. Good, uh, good idea by Holger. <laughs> Thank you. So now the boot capacity and you can see it doesn't matter if the roof is open or not. It will always remain like this, 281 liters. Of course, it's a big advantage if you compare it to a hard top. So this one will not change because the roof is basically on that. When I put a cabin trolley in here, you can also see that works quite well. So um, indeed for two people for a weekend trip, that's still fine. And here you can also open this small hatch. Don't open the hatch, don't open the hatch. <laughs> well, someone opened the hatch at some point then, you know, remember that? Yeah, hello. <laughs> of course, you can close it then here again. But I mean, you get some more possibilities then with that at least. Welcome to Thomas's active driving lounge today with the all new Z4, the M40i with this 3 liter 6 cylinder. And well, I mean, driving with open top is always an enjoyment, and especially if it's a roadster, an agile roadster. And I'm just driving in the comfort mode now to start it off, and the steering is super precise and direct. See here, just a slight command directly some changes something on the road. Also here, close to Sintra, close to Kashkais, near Lisbon, <laughs> I have given a couple of hints, it's one of, the, one of my favorite tracks here. Really cool, it's public road, of course don't it's exaggerated, but you can still drive in a very enjoyable way. And you hear the engine sound when you drive it slowly and being in comfort mode, you can also drive it rather silently, that's no problem. It's also, of course, important if you're starting in a neighborhood or something. And it feels very refined and the car feels super balanced. And it is not so exaggerating from the driving feeling that you would say, oh, it's such a fun car, but I couldn't drive more than an hour with it. I feel I can drive also longer with that and that's also very important. It doesn't, for example, feel as rough as a Porsche, for example, you know, like the, the Porsche Boxster has an advantage due to the midship engine concept, but this one here more feels cruisable as well. But the question is, if we go, for example, to the sport mode, have that adaptive suspension a little bit stiffened up, also then shifting up later, shifting down earlier, we can now also hear something more of the sound. Does that also, whoa, that's a huge rock. We shouldn't. Hit that one, wow. Yeah, that can happen here. Now you hear something more of the sound. The question is, can this car also be aggressive? Here when I'm having the throttle and then letting the throttle go, you hear those exhaust valves plop, 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 from the rear, really interesting. And immediately it's directly on the gas, so 
It almost feels like an electric vehicle because it's light, it's not too big, but still I got this immediate throttle response. And of course the road is not too bad, so it doesn't get too uncomfortable, although we are on the sporty adaptive suspension setting. Really feels like being in perfect control. The sport control, sport mode also lets me you know play around with the car just a little bit more. I mean, even now at 70 kilometers an hour, it feels basically, you know, like nothing for this vehicle. So you can so easily catch those corners, and it's really super fun. The rear can go out just a little bit in the sport mode. You have to pay attention to that. Of course, rear wheel driven only, and with so much power on the rear axle, really have to pay attention. Wow. I mean, I'm not even shifting back a gear. <laughs> Holger's like <gasps> on the co-driver's seat. But he's used to that stuff when he's drivers with, drives with me. Wow. Really cool. Also, you can use the pedals here. <laughs> flap, flap. Shifting up or shifting down. If I'm going to do from third to second. Wow, that is a really good sound. It's always nice to use the menu shifting pedals. So if the corner gets a little bit sharper, I feel in my fingers basically how I rub the tire to the ground, but the car won't go anywhere in the front. So, um, this is basically the farthest it goes away from understeering. Wow, what a performance. Really, really nice. I mean, you can also go to a um, traction control setting on something. Um, however, for public roads, I cannot recommend that. There's a you know, sport DSC or ESC. And then you can also turn it completely off if you want to spin around the car, for example, in the parking lot. But again, it should only be done when you're not on public roads because, again, so much power just on the rear axle and in the sport mode, you can already spin it around just a little bit in the corners. And you can see I'm rather relaxed in steering, so I don't have to steer so much. I really like how progressive they've made that steering. Really, really so I'm having a lot of fun um, of course it doesn't feel super purist the vehicle if you compare it with older roadsters you know or even some smaller ones yes they have grown in size but still you know um, I think basically I can understand this decision especially after after driving it because in everyday driving light you need some more comfort most times unless you're really, you know, like the super racer guy. And here indeed, they could combine. Still some great roadster driving fun, but you have comfort left. So let's turn around and because this part of the road is so great, I'll just want to do it once more. <laughs> Best ride since months. Best ride since months, says Holger. So he's obviously also enjoying it. And I think it's also a good sign. So, I mean, how do you feel as a co-driver? Is it like too bad on, on your bike? No, is, it, is it fine? Only fun. Cool. So I think that's always a good sign when the co-driver says it's really fun. That also speaks for the car. That's, you know, because there are some very extreme sports cars where the co-driver is like, <gasps> Holger was, was joking uh, earlier for that. So obviously he is enjoying it, and then I can enjoy it maybe a little bit more. Wow. It almost sounds a little bit like a Formula One car, right? <laughs> and again, the manual mode is of course really cool. Blopping from the exhaust valve. I really like how balanced the car is. Just a... Yeah, suspension-wise, I mean, look at that now, like slalom. 
wow look at the response and how it's incredible how good the handling of this car is although it does not have a midship engine concept so they really figured out that weight distribution so anyone thinking like wait a minute is this half a toyota actually even if it would be i would not care at all because it really drives superbly so oh heard that you know what about when i really accelerate it hard so i can also go to this sport shifting mode now with the uh with the gear shifter to the to the left side and it's even a little bit more extreme now going downhill let's see the brakes always be careful when a lot of people are on the road those bigger brakes in the m40i do a good job as well now some corners to enjoy for you now the brakes will work a little bit more amazing and the greatest thing is Although there's so much horsepower just in the rear axle, I really feel super much in control still of the car. Very important thing. So, if you compare it also with the... Oh, that's a real world star there. If you compare it with the previous generation of the Z4, it feels more grown up. And yes, it has even grown in length just a little bit. But although it has grown up, it is still very very agile so the newest technology made this possible so we still have this super fun ride but it's definitely more comfortable than before so and i think this would also be a key factor to me because so far sometimes i had a lot of fun in the uh, older set force but after a while the lower back was aching just a little bit and i feel that's becoming better now for sure so what about some, let's say when the road is a little bit straighter here now, for example, let's go back to the, let's say, the second gear and have like 40 kilometers and then hammer it just through. That was already 80. That was just 40 to 80 kilometers. Just like this. part with the big rock should be coming soon or are we already past that because you have to bear in mind that also that sure looked like a BMW 8 series hmm I guess we can drive an auto food as well we will link that review of course for you that was the big rock so now there's a truck in front of us so we hold just a little bit and let him drive and there's something else we can try actually so um you know some small acceleration from standstill for example and what we do for that is i'm um, going to the traction mode so this is basically sport ec go with the sport mode also as a shifting lever and then we hammer the brakes all through and go through the throttle launch control That was on 0 to 70. So I was just going straight again because I was seeing possible danger from other cars. So now again, a little bit safer. Let's try. No, it doesn't want to do it a second time. That's strange. Let's pull over to the side just a little bit. So that's always something. I had that with um, some AMG cars already. Um, that sometimes was not possible to repeat it instantly. Um, by the way, we have your cameras, also very well to see everything. So, traction to the left side, sport mode there. Let's go to the road again, no one is coming. Hitting the brakes hard. No. So now it's not, not saying me that, that it would do the launch control. So obviously you cannot repeat it that often just after each other. Hmm, too bad, but you know, that's why we're also doing those tests. But I mean, 
I carried the launch crew through until about 70 kilometers, and that was actually pretty decent as well. So it, the, the key thing of that is, you know, not to be most spectacular, but to get the most traction to the ground. And that's clearly what this vehicle did there. So maybe try to cool it off a little bit. So still got the EC on traction, so again they can play around with the car a little bit more. Sport plus mode. Let's see. Let's try it once more. The car is now willing to do it again. Yeah, now he's doing it. Now the other Z4 is coming, just waiting for safety. Here we go guys. <laughs> so I know. Yep. That was again 0 to 70, but again, I won't go through with it all the way, just for safety precautions. But definitely very impressive. Maybe we should try that, like with the, going through the higher speed at the racetrack once. And of course, always a good sound for you to hear then too. So, I mean, the agility of this vehicle, that's what we are testing here mainly with this car today. But I think it's also quite suitable for an everyday driving life, this is also something in the evolution of this vehicle for sure. As for the wind features, by the way, I mean, driving with the open top here, that's also something that changed. They inc increased it actually, or, you know, improved it. It doesn't have to be that warm anymore with this vehicle. So before you had a lot of wind coming to the cabin, but now not so much anymore, at least when you have the windows up there. So this can also move this car more to a summer-only convertible to an all-season convertible. That would also be very important to me, for sure. So I wonder if it fits with our camera when we put the roof up. Let's just risk it. Yeah, that works. So now we're also we're driving 40 kilometers. 50 would be the maximum. We close the roof while driving. That's also the reason I really love soft tops. I would always go with that. And now it's probably silent in here. Of course, the big difference to driving with open top, that's for sure. So now you can also hear the more sonorous low frequency sound of that vehicle when the roof is closed. And I mean, it's actually quite silent in here. I'm driving 90 kilometers an hour now, almost 90. So the sound dampening also was increased. That might also be important if you think about you know, going for a coupe or for a convertible. Sometimes you want to go a little bit faster uh, and still want it properly silent on the interior. I mean, if you're going on long autobahn motorway runs, this could even speak for a two liter engine because at some point, maybe this one might get too loud. However, if you go in the comfort mode, then you can also decrease it. So also then, you know, the, the valve is not that active. So you have in the comfort mode and have the roof closed. <laughs> There's the 8 Series again. They are also dri driving this road up and down. It's really cool. So here in comfort mode and with roof closed, you can also have a silent experience. That's also quite nice. I think that also works on a, on a longer term, for example. However, what I feel again that this um, leather surface is getting really hot, although it's just 20 degrees Celsius outside. I mean, I'm working a little bit with the car, yes, but again, the Alcantara seats would stay cooler. That would be definitely a good advantage for that. So, so my editor driving them with top closed. Even in the comfort mode here, when the car is silent, it's really fun to drive. Then again, if you put it to the sports mode, more responsive. So concluding on these BMW M models, yes, indeed, the M340i together with the M440i, they are the all-rounder models and also one of the most popular ones, just overtaken recently by the i4 M50 because for taxation reasons and so on, a lot of people go for this M model. 
However, when you think about the true M experience, of course, the true M models, they are just stiffer, rougher, even sportier, louder and so on. So if you want that kind of experience, the M3 would be something for you. Here, the M3 Touring kind of offers this combination, you know, that you can still have a car for everyday driving and also some more space. At the same time, you have this great performance. The BMW M5 versus M550i, this comparison actually showed that the M performance models are just better for everyday driving, actually, because of the suspension setup. Whereas the true M models, they are without compromise. It really depends on what you really wish from that vehicle. The all new BMW 5 Series is definitely very interesting because it has this new user interface. It also adds this electric option. So it is a little bit more versatile as for the powertrains for sure. Of course, in the overall comfort, they also come close. The new 5 Series offers even more better alternatives as for animal free materials, for example. True M experience are, in my opinion, more with the smaller models. It was started initially with the BMW E30, this M3 in the original spec there. And these are today more the 2 series models like the M240i. So this one gives a rather puristic experience. And therefore also my very favorite M vehicle is the Z4 because it is a vehicle that is thought out to be a pure sports car. It is not another version of an already existing car. It was built to be a sports car and that's also the main reason why I think it fits best to this M aspect here with the six cylinder. Recently with the update you can now also get the combination six cylinder and manual drive so the manual transmission so this could be also something for a purist m lover what do you think which one is your favorite m vehicle in this very test tell me in the comments and also join us for more comparison episodes